Hey guys, what's up? It is week 221 and let you guys know the contest for the Django 4K is still going on. Uh, North America entries only please, but send an uh, entry to ScreamingToiletContest at gmail.com and I'll draw within a couple weeks. That's all you have to do. And the title, please leave, just say Django or Contest or Django Contest or something like that. Make it easier on me to sort the emails. Yeah, and I'll ship it anywhere in North America. Um, this is an excellent movie if nobody's seen it. Sergio Carbucci, 19, is it 66, Spaghetti West. Western, one of the big ones. It also looks glorious in 4K from Arrow. It looks amazing. So, yep, if you want to win that, just shoot an email over to Screaming Toilet Contest at gmail.com. So let's hop into the first reviews, and this is a weird one. Uh, this is from Culture Shock, which is a relatively new company, but they put out some uh, other titles like Split. They have Creep Tales that just came out, um, and a lot of strange stuff. They uh, what was the one? God, uh, Good Night, God Bless, which is a bizarre '80s British police procedural slasher is the way I'd put it. But this one is uh, one of their Blu-rays, which they don't always do Blu-rays. The elements permit they do. This is Death Collector, which originally was released um, it was on a Media Blasters in one of the Rare Flix collections, and I never got a chance to watch it. So this is like it's always like this, like these movies I, I buy like three times before I ever get a chance to watch them sometimes. Uh, just like having a video store mentality where I can grab everything. So yeah, this is definitely has like a, a cult appeal. This is a weird movie. I don't even know how to go about this. Um, and I know a lot of people aren't big into the weird kind of explanations or, or little like tag things you put into a movie but literally I feel like it's like if a video game character from a side scroll or beat em up had a dream this is how the movie plays. Like, it, it logically, a lot of the stuff is just absurd. It, it takes place in some sort of post-apocalyptic world where the rules are insane. So uh, we kind of follow the story of this kind of drifter character who carries around a guitar and he's uh his brother is the sheriff of this town he ends up coming in for the day the sheriff is actually played by one of three psychos in love alumni who's in this movie uh the sheriff is played by you know the geez what i, I the actor the character in psychos in love is the cannibal um plumber really gross character eating fingers out of drains and everything like that so uh he's in this and he's uh, the brother of the main character anyways some tragedy strikes and there's kind of a guy who runs this town the brother is killed and the main baddie has like this huge life insurance policy and everything is run by a life insurance company right you have to have the life insurance policy it's the only way to make a living only way to make money yada 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 so everything's under this everybody has one anyways the lead character gets sent to uh sent to jail sent to prison he's like in a chain gang and one day they just release everybody from prison they don't know why and it basically like the big world economy has collapsed and everything is chaos so everybody's put into the streets he of course made friends with uh, uh you know his best friend it's very generic kind of in that way in a lot of ways it has like the generic tropes of like the buddy in that kind of way like character sent to prison meets a friend in prison but it, it's also super bizarre and the characters don't even act human half the time um the main baddie is obsessed with bowling which um brings in some, I hope it's intentional humor by him bowling. It's gotta be. It's just so bizarre and off the wall that he's like, nobody ever makes me late, especially for bowling. I think that's probably the line that anybody who watches this movie will take away from it. Um, the main her hero type is an actor who's in a bunch of other things, and there's a, a little documentary on here by Mike Malloy, who breaks down a lot of the stuff about the movie. Just 10 minutes, a lot of interesting things, which I actually... With that context in there, some of the stuff like I should have known while watching the movie, but I didn't register it. With that context, that little feature on there really helped me gain a little bit more appreciation for the movie because this one fit into the world, or like if you, if it's like one of these ones that you see on paper, like the de uh, that I would love on paper by the description, like Devil Story or The Carrier, the '80s film where the guy who touches everything and anybody touches the organic matter melts. Yeah, like I'm like, oh, that sounds totally up my alley. Um, you know, the Devil Story sounds totally up my alley. But then when I watched the movies, there's just something missing like some connective tissue now the devil story is due to boredom but the other two are just including this one death collector and the carrier are just they're so absurd and weird like i never can gain anything in the world i'm always just like what in the hell is this uh but there's like there's these moments of either comedic unintentional or intentional humor especially with the villain 
and all sorts of bizarre stuff going on. The performance of the lead guy here is just really overly dramatic. And he, he was like an actor in a bunch of stuff. And, and like I said, Mike Molloy points out some of his performances. And the one that comes to mind right when he said it, I was like, oh yeah, I do remember his performance, even though I hadn't seen that movie since high school in Philadelphia. He plays a character in there. Um, so yeah, I mean, like there was a lot of people in here that I didn't even register who they were watching, like Ruth Collins. I was like, oh shit, that's the lady from Doom Asylum with gives one of the most over-the-top performances of all time, maybe. Uh, and one of the most ridiculous slashers of all time, maybe. Doom Asylum. Um, so I was just like, a lot of things that I didn't notice. And I, I recognized the lady right in the beginning as um, somebody I knew. And I was like, shit, 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 who is that? And then right when I was like, oh, Psycho's in love. Yes, yes, one of my favorite movies. So, And again, the third alumni in here is Ruth Collins herself. So we have three Psychos in Love alumni, which I, I'm a big fan of that movie, if anybody doesn't know. And we have a post-apocalyptic world with a lot of gunplay um, and just... Just crazy shit going on so like on paper it's a movie that just attracts me to it right uh it doesn't always play out in like a logical sense I, like i said like the people just act strange one minute this girl is interested in lead i mean she can't stand him and then she's interested and it's just like funny stuff like they're out in this like post-apocalyptic i guess landscape of snow and rain and they're at a burning like it's not even burning it's just a tire yard and they're like we came out here for and they have an umbrella with holes in it of course a nice picnic and you're ruining it and it's just like what the fuck kind of thing is going on here? Is it's like it has to be intentionally funny, but aesthetically, there's lots of good aesthetics. Like I would put this as like if you were to have like a character from a side scroll and beat him up like Streets of Rage 2 had a dream. Like the aesthetic is like that. There's lots of thick like atmosphere and fog and just bad guys wearing absolutely ridiculous things that are kind of mixed in with like western and punk aesthetic mixtures. They're just super bizarre and. and weird like i said kind of like uh just its own kind of thing going on in this world so uh yeah there's a lot of cool things going for it, but at the same time it's weird ineptness and a lot of the over-the-top acting is just it's just a bizarre mixture of things and there's literally a scene where one of the characters is like killing bad guys in a hallway for seemingly ever like it just doesn't seem to end it's very repetitive and then that character is killed unceremoniously without much impact and it's just like why all that for that? Uh, but I would not deter anyone from checking this movie out. They remastered it. It looks really good in comparison to the, like the old stuff they had. They had like a beat up print. They showed they cleaned it up a bit, took out some of the, like the lines that went through. So they did a really good job, and I'm sure that no one besides maybe Vinegar Syndrome would have gave this movie the time and day uh, to do such a good job on it. Uh, like I said, I did enjoy the features, Mike Malloy. Um, he does a really good job. I've heard him on a couple podcasts, like the Projection Booth. He popped up on a podcast about a couple of the Spaghetti Westerns. He did the Big Gun Down. Um, so this guy is like an expert on tough guy cinema is what they put him at. And uh, hear him on podcasts and other like supplemental material. He's a, he's a very educated guy, very, does a good job. And in this one, in this little particular 10-minute featurette or whatever you want to call it, he kind of breaks down how this movie has a lot of connections with bigger films and it's not just some completely low budget obscure movie that no connections to anything and he also kind of makes some jokes that pertain to the movie and everything like that so obviously a fan so he adds a little humor to it it's a good featurette then there's also a 14 minute like featurette with interviews with uh, some of the people involved with it. I think the director, and geez, there's some other people. Like I said, one of the actresses, because, uh, of course, the, the lead in this passed away from HIV. Um, he actually played one of the characters in Philadelphia who was dying of AIDS in it. And um, I, I read some weird kind of note, and I think Mike Malloy mentions it a bit, too, that like a lot of those actors, like it said something like 53. There's 53 actors who had HIV in that movie, and like 40, like in the character-wise, and like 43 of them are dead now. So it's just, like, so they really kind of cast a lot of people who actually were in fear of the disease and had it and everything like that so besides that there's a special introduction oh wait one day one scene one cameo audio interview with phil nutman and there's an alternate opening credit sequence with the original title tin star void uh and there's a, again a side-by-side -side video showing restoration of death collector five minutes a trailer and trailers for upcoming culture shock releases so uh keep an eye on this company um they did a really good job with the slip cover it's it's high quality and yeah, it's nice to see another niche label kind of come out here and put out some more titles. Uh, yeah, what else? I think I covered another one of their movies as well, if I'm not mistaken. So check out their website and everything like that, Culture Shock. Also a great name. Because um, honestly, a lot of times I'll sit and think, I was like, if I ever started a label, if I came across a, a decent amount of money, what would the name be? What would the name be? And I'm like, oh, said, no, it's already taken. I mean, Culture Shock is a perfect one. So Death Collector, not really a favorite of mine or anything like that, but just a, a nice release of a super weird 
weird movie that I think um, this would be a good one. Like, if you were played at midnight with a group of people, like, and I don't mean this as a bad thing or anything, like, if, like a Tammy and the T-Rex, where everybody's just, like, scratching their head at how fucking weird everything is, but at the end of the day, it's a cult item, and everyone kind of re-celebrates it. And that's kind of a theme here, I guess, that I'll go into later, including the question of the week about movies getting a second life on Blu-ray and all that kind of deal, because there's a lot of them that are pretty much almost forgotten, and especially if they only have VHS or sometimes never even that in the States, a second life on Blu-ray. Um, also, seeing something cleaned up changes a lot of things. So, yeah, that's Death Collector. Check it out if you're interested i'll be reviewing creep tales next week from them so yeah okay this next one is from severn films and this is skin deep by gabe bartolos he also directed a movie that came out a couple years back that severn put out called saint bernard and saint bernard is kind of one of these weird movies a journey movie adventure movie where like a character just is going through this strange day of weird shit and runs in all sorts of crazy characters in a bizarre insane world when you don't know what's reality and what's fiction and fantasy and insanity that kind of mixture and skin deep you can uh, <laughs> it's pretty much kind of in that weird vein of I don't know what's reality and, and, and whatnot. I mean, it, it has a, a more straightforward storyline than St. Bernard, but it's a super bizarre film. So, uh, Gabe Bartolos was a special effects artist. He did stuff for Frank Hanelotter, and you can tell by the effects in this movie. He also worked on the Leprechaun films, hence Warwick Davis popping up in this one. Um, just interviews with Gabe Bartolos I've seen in a lot of things, and he seems like a really cool guy. Usually the special effects guys are some of the cooler guys, you know, at least as far as interviews are concerned for me. So, uh, Skin Deep. This movie, um, it was released, like I said, in 2003, and it was one that I never saw. I had heard mixed things. Some people really love it. I know there's a guy out there, Mikey Fish, adores Skin Deep. Um, yeah, this might have been the first time he bought a Blu-ray because of it, so there we go. And there's some people that absolutely hate it. One of my co-hosts on 22 Shots of Moods and Horror, Jeremy, can't stand this movie. So I, I kind of expected something in the middle. I am a big fan of, like, um, do-it-yourself movies from, like, the Tempe time frame and, and before and stuff like that so I can get behind the spirit of independent movie so right when this put uh, started I, I feel like this has to be shot on film I, I don't think it's a low low grade digital because the aesthetic it, it really kind of popped out to me I liked how it looked um, the remastered blu-ray or whatever I thought that it had like a, a good unique look about it everybody in this movie acts like a nutcase everybody um, including the, the typical kind of family traveling and the actual family of crazy people, including Warwick Davis and the guy with the gas mask, the weird, not gas mask, but weird chopper claws, goggle things. Um, and there's a character of the brain and a sweet old lady who's not so sweet. So essentially, you know, it's kind of a Texas Chainsaw Massacre deal, right? Kind of a family of strange characters that are on an isolated road that kidnap people and butcher them and slaughter them. But it's done by Gabe Bartolo, so it's going to be even fucking weirder in this kind of modern do-it-yourself kind of time frame when it was in 2003, I guess, modern, whatever, you guys know what I mean. So, uh, essentially, this family of, I think, four are traveling, they run into these people, they have some car trouble, obviously, done by the, the group, and uh, it's just up to, basically, this girl to survive as her family gets butchered and everything like that. There's some run-in with a gang of bikers, some carpenters that the get, that the monsters slaughter. Um, there's some weird CGI uh, involving the Warwick Davis character, who is uh, uh, carries these plates on his back and throws... He plays the leprechaun, if you guys aren't familiar. He's also Will, Wicket and Willow, and uh, he's in... Um, not Wicket and Willow. <laughs> he's in Willow, and he plays Wicket in Star Wars. Or is he Return of the Jedi? Sorry about that. So he's like throwing plates and everything. So it's just a bonkers ass movie. I'm not going to lie. The first 20 minutes I started, I liked kind of the crazy pace and weirdness and everything like that. And after a while, it wore out its welcome for me. It just was kind of like, okay, this is just almost a little too inept to follow and and just insanity and everything like that. Uh, Forey uh, Ackerman from Famous Monsters, uh, I believe that was the magazine he had. Um, yeah, he pops up in a lot of uh, horror films as cameos including Return of the Dead Part 2 and a slew of others. I think he's even in the Aftermath, the 80s movie, if I'm not mistaken. The one that made the video nasties, maybe Section 3 list, which shouldn't have been on there in the first fucking place. But, uh, yeah, he, he has a little cameo in this one. Uh, so... Yeah, anyways, it's just a bizarre film, to be honest. Um, and I don't really know how to go about it. I, everybody acts super weird. Some of the people are acting... Like, you don't want to really judge the acting in here because it's so over-the-top and weird. It's just like, are they bad? Or is this movie just insane? And I feel like a lot of it is also adr so I feel like that sucks a little bit out of everybody's performance. Uh, as far as the special effects are concerned, the practical effects are really fun. I really dig them. And um, seeing, like, the, the crazy monster makeup on people... I 
I enjoy as well. Uh, although every once in a while, the main guy, the uh, Surgeon General, you can see like his skin underneath. But I'm not gonna complain about that. Okay, that's just nitpicking and being like it's like whatever. You know, it happens. But uh, yeah, some some of the other stuff I enjoyed. Uh, you can tell the designs, especially like the brain or something, looks like he walked off the set of Basket Case Two, the one with all the kind of uh, you know the freaks kind of style one. But uh, yeah, so you can kind of see that deal in here. As far I, like I said, the special effects are fun. Some of the practical effects are really cool. But the movie just it's not it's not something I absolutely adore. It's just like I said, if I maybe would have saw this younger, I'd have more appreciation for it. The body count is high though too. Um, it's just a it's a bonkers ass weird movie that either you're gonna get behind or, or just kind of just feel like it's too inept to grasp anything and that's kind of where I'm at for it I don't dislike it or anything I just don't really care for it either so yeah there are some special features on here there's a deep cuts a look back at with writer director producer Gay Bartolos actors Jason Dungry and Caroline Brandt and weapons machinist Jake Lee there's also an audio commentary with cast and crew and archival making a featurette um, <laughs> one of the actors in here kind of brings up how they made him run down the street naked which is very much like a head and a lot of thing from basket case one it reminded me a lot of when uh geez was that Ke kevin uh not going to say his last name had to run down the street naked in that one um so yeah it, it obviously feels like and this is also an unrated version so i believe it is longer and there's some edits and some fixed up sound and everything like that I did enjoy the father character because he's so corny uh, and everything like that. He's like, hey, guys, and just super overly polite and just whatever. But uh, even to the point where at one point he's just like such a generic character. He's like, I love my country and I love it and just all that kind of stuff. But anyways, uh, in a cheesy way, not just uh, but uh, skin deep. Uh, I'm glad that it got a, a Blu-ray because this one, again, a movie that is getting kind of a second life on Blu-ray, getting a new master and cut together differently and everything like that. Okay, this next one here is from 1976 and this is born for hell man i, I love that title um aka naked massacre and talk about um new lives on blu-ray here this is the u.s blu-ray premiere of the director's cut with all new special features so um this is a movie under the title naked massacre that i always avoided because every time i got a copy or bought a copy I would put it in and it was less than VHS. And I have no problem watching VHS, but it wasn't also a good looking VHS. It was a piss poor, like third, fourth generation VHS, whatever the hell, just looking like crap, digitized, uh, pig, pixelated shit. And there wasn't much love for the movie. So it was no, never like, you gotta watch Naked Massacre and the title and everything, like it could either be something like good or bad with that title. So when Severin uh, kind of announced that they were putting out Naked Massacre, AK Born From Hell, and I was like, oh, well, I know, like, uh, Severn's a company I love, and I usually like almost everything or am interested in everything they put out, so maybe it's time to pay a little bit more attention to this movie. Seeing then that it was the kind of uh, the um, director's cut, never before seen, kind of edited in the United States, I was like, oh, shit, well... That makes sense why the, you know, the copy probably looked like crab, and it just wasn't getting as much respect. So, um, in the 60s, there was this ma a spree killer... Some people refer to him as a serial killer, but spree killer, just in terms of the, the time frame, of uh, Richard Speck, who murdered eight nurses uh, one day in, in a grueling way. And he also is infamous for later on being in prison and having taken some uh, growth hormone where he grew breasts. And it was just like this weird uh, video of him partying and giving somebody oral sex and all sorts of stuff like that. So he's kind of an infamous mass murderer, serial killer, criminal, whatever. So... This one, Born for Hell, was based on his crimes, but they had to change some things around. They, they break a lot of this down on the special features, which are great, by the way. So they had to break a lot. They had to change a lot of this. So they changed the location. So instead of having this in Chicago, they move it to Ireland, where there's kind of like this big kind of turmoil and war kind of between, you know, religions going on at the time in the movie and probably in real life as well, because they're obviously trying to make a statement about that. And they also make the character, they change the character's name and they make him a Vietnam vet. So they kind of add that element in there too, kind of trying to knock home the senseless violence or why is there so much violence or is the human nature all that kind of stuff which be more interesting and they also changed the they said they changed the number of people they killed but i don't think that's right i think that spec killed eight and eight people are killed in this movie as well so 
we kind of follow this character. And it's one of these movies where you follow the serial killer most of the time, or the killer, or the person who's going to do these things. And he's semi-sympathetic at first. He's, he's a, they cast a handsome actor who's in a handful of pictures, a French actor. So he has his, you know, he's playing an American. He's 80 yards, so it's not perfect, but it's still a good performance. And he kind of is out of money, and he wants to make it back to the States and everything like that. And he's thrown away from war, and he's immediately thrown in this like, kind of like war place where there's these two factions going after each other. And in between this is a group of girls, uh, nine women, that are kind of going to nursing school and they share like the same common quarters and everything like that. And we follow them around a bit too. And we know that obviously these two kind of storylines are going to connect. They're in the same area. So we, we follow this character a lot. Um, we see him kind of sleeping in like uh, homeless shelters and he kind of befriends this this Vietnam this Vietnamese guy. And their relationship is very strange. And at one point, it seems that this Vietnamese guy kind of solicits to him, which isn't in the American cut, if I'm mistaking. I think there's that's the difference there. He kind of solicits to him, and his reaction is weird. And I, I, I wonder if they're kind of playing into that. Like, I don't know if that tape was out with Richard Speck or anything like that, but they might be playing into the weird sexuality of the character. Um, obviously, he has a disdain for women, and they play into that fact as well with his wife and everything in the past and the cheating, and you never know when he gets upset about certain things, if he's upset about his wife, who she cheated with, or what what's going on with that. But eventually, he, of course, kind of infiltrates this nurse, uh, this nurse uh, kind of common grounds where they're all staying the night, at, and he starts to systematically kill them off. And it's really kind of unpleasant as hell. I mean, all killings are, but this one's done in that kind of way where it's it's not like gratuitously gory, but it is extremely violent, of course. And a lot of it seems personal. Well, he'll talk to the characters, and, and there's this one point where it's very exploitative where he takes these two women, there one where he overheard one of them obviously has a, a, a sexual attraction to the other one, and he makes them kind of have these weird kind of um, sexual situation where he wants one to start sexually pleasuring the other one and he's watching and it's just it's just a really unpleasant thing so it's just a grueling kind of moment where he just like systematically kills these people and I don't want to say I'm not like, spoiling anything because it is a true story and it's kind of known that this one is based on a true story but uh, the title comes from the tattoo that the killer wears born for hell on there in real life Richard Speck um, all this is special features but also I, I do know a little bit about the case you know liking that kind of stuff or not liking it but being interested in it he had a tattoo that said born to race hell um so like they do a lot of the things in there uh, of course they have to change some things like i would say that they said that now in real life richard speck had he could be um he could he could speak well had his southern manners but he was not a handsome man you know, he obviously was not a very good-looking guy. This guy, on the other hand, is more of an attractive fellow that can, I, you could see, kind of manipulate such situations. But, uh, yeah, it's just a it's a dark movie that brings up a lot of questions, and it, it was really great. I thought it was a tremendous film. And this is a movie that I probably would have never, ever got around to. Maybe, maybe I would have, eventually. But it's just kind of a, a hidden gem if you will. And this, in this version, at least, was a hidden gem. Um, they also, I think, changed the music in the American version. But, yeah, there's some good features on here. The Other Side of the Mirror interview with actor Mathels. Uh, it's a French name. I, when it comes to pronunciation and 90% of other things, I'm a dumb dumb. So, Mathieu uh, Crenier, and he talks about some of the movies he's been in. He was actually in Malpertis by the director of Daughters of Darkness with Orson Welles. And he's in a slew of other movies, too, some of which look interesting. And he talks about this movie and everything like that. Um, then there's the Nightmares in Chicago, Remembering the Richard Speck Murders with filmmakers John McNaughton and Gary Sherman. Two great filmmakers. John McNaughton obviously directed Henry Porch of a Serial Killer. And they, um, Gary Sherman did, you know, Vice Squad and uh, Raw Meat and Poltergeist 3 and Dead and Buried, which is a great film I just reviewed a couple weeks ago. So these guys kind of talk about growing up in Chicago, when that murder happened, and their personal kind of experiences and everything like that. So I, that's a nice little featurette. And then a new kind of crime, the Richard Speck story with Once About a Time crime podcaster Esther Ludlow, which is nice because she kind of talks about you know a little bit of psychology and just breaks down the whole case and how the people were killed and everything like that. Uh, bombing Here, Shooting There, a video essay by filmmaker Chris O'Neill. 
uh, this one is nice because they kind of point out the kind of mixing of that stuff and point out like the Ireland background and all that kind of stuff. And then there's an artist, Joe Coleman on Richard Speck. And this guy seems to be kind of a centric artist type um, who knows a lot about the case and seems to have sympathy for kind of the people that society looks at as absolute garbage. So his kind of idea on the whole thing, talking about Richard Speck, and he actually has some artifacts from the, the thing. He actually has a picture and a, that uh, he talks about a lot with Richard Speck in there. Uh, in the picture where he worked at Frito before it was Frito-Lay, and he gets into the details about that. Interesting, interesting stuff. And then we have the Inside the Auditorium with Joe Coleman. And then we have Naked Massacre, the U.S. video release cut, so fans of the original version can watch that as well, and the Italian trailer. So, boom, this was a hidden gem for me. Great release. And uh, dare I say it, a great movie that I never thought would have been great. So that was a nice surprise. And I'm not one to stick my nose up to certain movies. I'll watch anything. It just, it was one that had been pushed so far back for me that uh, I just probably would never get to it. And finally, boom, uh, Second Life for sure. Great, great stuff. Sorry about that. I know there's going to be some audio issues right there. I just caught it. So some of the video is going to have some messed up audio here and there. I really apologize for that. Uh, sometimes things go wrong when you're recording and everything like that. So um, this next one here, talking about Second Life's, is Siege, which um, I saw originally, I think, under self-defense on like a VHS rip. This was, what, 83, 82? I don't want to mistake that here. I think it was 82. Um, so yeah. This is one I watched uh, because I know the guys at Pure Cinema Podcast, uh, in particular Brian Sauer, was giving this a lot of love. And uh, also another one they were talking about, Enemy Territory possibly, was one they were bringing up. So anyways, Siege. When I first watched it, I thought it was a decent film. I liked it. I didn't love it. This time around, giving a movie a second life, really dug this one. So, and maybe it's just because seeing how I, you know, within a couple of years, even though this stuff is going on forever, um, within a couple of years, stuff that always is happening is brought closer to your attention. Kind of like these crazy, you know, extremist groups kind of torturing and attacking people and everything like that. So that's a lot what the siege is about. So, um, one day, um, this, this, this is this time I actually watched the extended TV version, which adds like 15 minutes to the very beginning. Originally I watched the original version. Um, now the director prefers the original version. But watching an extended version added a little bit of the experience to me, kind of understanding a little bit of the characters and everything like that. So, Siege. Essentially, this uh, is a story about, um, in Nova Scotia, I believe, the cops have gone on strike. So, uh, one night, this kind of extremist group of, you know, they're kind of like Nazi types. They hate homosexuals. They decide to go into this uh, gay club and just rough them up and beat the shit out of them. They're like complete morons, especially the guy who's kind of seemingly the leader of this goose. Just an absolute obnoxious monster. He's just being a douche and somebody gets killed. So they call their boss accidentally killed they call their boss and he decides to execute everyone in there so nobody gets in trouble um one of the uh people that is uh there they escape at the last second and they end up running into this uh, apartment kind of complex or like duplex kind of area where this guy uh kind of decides to help him and house him because he sees this gang chasing him this gang will not let that slide because obviously they're going to be wanted for several murders. Um, so they basically attack them. Hence, a big siege happens. What they don't know is that the people they decided to attack that live in this duplex are kind of a, a couple of them are apartment building are military kind of guys or survivalists. You see like the Soldier of Fortune magazine in the back. So these guys know how to survive. And they're up against the odds. These other guys have high-class weapons and everything like that. Um, they don't have to worry about the police coming. Um, there's also a couple blind people that are there at the time, which is which makes matters even worse. One of which is played by Keith Knight, who pops up in stuff like My Bloody Valentine. And, of course, the class of 1994, 84, he plays Barnyard, one of the, uh, the gang members. I love Barnyard. He's great in that movie. No risk. I probably said the same thing last time I covered this movie. So big fan of Class 84, if you guys don't know, uh, Mark Lester for life. So anyway, Siege, it's a Siege movie. So think Assault on Precinct 13, think Night of the Living Dead, uh, Dog Soldiers, so many good Siege movies. Um, but this one has like good characters on both sides. And I don't mean the guy, I don't mean it how it sounds right there. There's good people on both sides. That sounded so funny. I don't mean it like that. I mean, there's good characters. Okay, there's good actors in here. Good characters. So the bad guys are pretty memorable. Like I said, besides Goose, there's this guy, Rosie. He's just this, like, oh, just this piggy guy, right? And the very beginning, the added extended version shows this scene where he, like, shows up to the house of Goose, where Goose is just, like, treating his wife like utter garbage. And you're just like, what a loser, like, complaining about, you use margarine instead of butter. It's like, 
here's the thing. After you become an adult, if you ever complain when someone makes you food, you deserve to get thrown right in your face. Then don't, don't fucking eat it if you don't like it. Okay? Make it yourself. Sorry. Um, rant over. <laughs> so Rosie shows up and like, I feel like there's a hole in the top of his pants and like his groin is showing. And I was just like baffled by that. Like even for like 80s standard, like sleazy goon, I was like, I don't think most guys would like let their groin hang out of their pants like that. <laughs> Maybe I'm just seeing it different, but like, I literally feel like the side view, like his, like his, his Johnson is like three, like centimeters away from just falling out. I Maybe my eyes are bad, but it's just, it's like, that's kind of a bold move there uh, for an extended Japanese version. So anyways, like I said, the action's good. Like people get picked off here and there. Um, and the bad guys are ruthless. And the main bad guy is just this like stone cold faced guy. Just looks like an asshole. Anyways, seeing this remastered and cleaned up did a lot for it. I thought that it uh, added a lot to the movie. Um, uh, and I like the film. Like I think it's a good film. I think it's uh, edge of your seat uh, kind of stuff here. And it, it hits home today, too. You know what I mean? With the, the kind of crazy people like that and, like, the problems with the police. Any second, like, if you know police, there could be these crazy, like, like extreme Nazi groups or whoever running around killing people. Just a lot of the stuff. And it just shows you that, like, we've been dealing with the same shit forever, unfortunately. Um, but, yeah, this is a great film. And the, the only special features on here besides the uh, extended cut is the audio commentary with co-director Paul Donovan and filmmaker Jason Eisner. Eisner's obviously a huge fan of the film. Um, yeah, so this is a good flick. I, I, I recommend you guys check it out if you guys not seen it. If you like Siege movies, you like action movies. I feel like so many old action movies feel a lot more grounded and there's stakes and people get killed that you don't want to get killed. That's my only complaint about modern action films is like they're just afraid to they touch everything so with delicate fingers. Like they don't want to kill anyone because they want a franchise or something like that. Anyways, Siege, great. So out of the three Severn titles for uh, this, this week, I, I put... Uh, Born for Hell and Siege, right at the, they're both great, both great releases, both, um, uh, second time watch for the Siege went up, uh, gets better with every viewing, so, and also, like I said, man, just cleaning something up and allowing, because Siege is kind of a dark film on VHS or Laserdisc is the rip I saw, it's kind of a darker film, so when it's cleaned up, you can see a lot what's going on, and that opening, that opening in the, the, the gay club is rough, rough stuff, you're just like, really intense and, and that might be a problem for some people that the intensity never reaches the heights like that again but just watching somebody kill like systematically kill like six seven people is just like oh fuck that's awful so anyways siege great stuff all films there is the tree the trunk that has to stabilize it but i kind of find that i'm interested in these branches and i'm running through these people and people are screaming and i don't know what to do so i start saying like coming through naked man sorry i'm just trying to be like this is fun nobody think that i'm a pervert Yay! There's no reason to be frightened. Uh, See? Born for hell. This is three years before the Manson murders. America, I believe, at the time was still relatively unaware of this type of violence. Richard Speck probably would normally be a serial killer but for the fact he committed these murders all in one night. Richard Speck is sought tonight for the murder of those eight student nurses in Chicago. It freaked me out because I'd always been obsessed with serial killers. You know, there's a lot of murder in the city of Chicago. It's not uncommon, certainly, but not like that. My father was a psychiatrist. He said it might be interesting to play that, to look at the other side of the mirror. out of my house now or I'm gonna put a hole in your head just big enough for your tiny brain to drop through. Anybody who touches the doorknob downstairs is gonna die. 
it's a nice day. Not for you. <laughs> Okay, talking about giving movies a second chance or a movie, watching a movie for the second time and how closely related the siege is to movies that are coming out uh, recently. And that's The Green Room. I decided to give The Green Room a second chance. This is by Jeremy Saunier, who directed movies like Murder Party, which I loved when it came out. Blue Ruin, which I loved. Hold the Dark, which is a good film as well. Um, and The Green Room in 2015. So, uh, when I originally saw The Green Room, I had watched his previous efforts, Murder Party and Blue Ruin, and I thought both of them were masterpieces in their own way, right? I was just like, these are so good, these are so good, and I loved them. So I was super excited to watch The Green Room. I knew it was about a punk band being trapped by Nazis. I was like, this sounds totally up my alley, kind of another Siege movie. Patrick Stewart was in it, Macon Blair was in it, uh, Anton Yelchin. I was like, sounds cool, sounds good. So when I watched it, I don't know what it was, but I just did not connect with it. I felt like for a simple Siege narrative, it had these convoluted parts with people changing sides and, and having these ideas of different things. This time around, none of that mattered. I got it. I, I just didn't, it did not nearly seem as convoluted as I originally had thought. There was just some people kind of obviously some things going on that I just didn't register. I don't know what it was. So maybe I wanted something along the lines of Blue Ruin where as bleak and sad as a lot of it is, there's this humanistic touch and it just, I don't know, it's a revenge film and it's cathartic, but also exactly how a revenge film should be that you really just don't get to walk away from it. While Green Room was shot like all the, even though Blue Ruin is feel grounded, it does feel grounded. Green Room, I guess it was just matter of fact and people died in a matter of fact way and people died that upset me maybe the movie upset me and it just left a bad taste in my mouth which is not a way to go about watching films because i i will admit there's a couple movies that have upset me but i feel like it was a they went out of their way to like make the script really lame to upset me and, and then maybe i just i liked green room i just didn't think it was great in comparison to the other films I was like, this would be a really great HBO movie that I watched in the 90s, like Surviving the Game or No Escape or something like that. I didn't think it was anything more than that. But watching this, like, it really just kind of landed with me. It, it had a scary sense to it, you know. So it's basically about a struggling, kind of traveling punk band that uh, gets, uh, they're, they're really low on money, and this guy offers them to play at this pl this club, kind of isolated in the, the woods, the Oregon Forest or whatever. Not Oregon Forest, but it is in Oregon. So, like, the, there's a lot of trees and a lot of rain and everything. It looks great, fa fantastic. I believe that's where it was shot and takes place at. Um, but so it's kind of like a little isolated club. So they go there and this just is a place that run by Nazis, lots of creeps. Um, Patrick Stewart is the owner. He's not there right away. So the first song they play is Nazi pucks fuck off, which, and I also think this movie has a, a deeper meaning The people that were into punk music or the punk scene growing up. I wasn't, I mean, I listened, I went to concerts and stuff, but I wasn't into like any particular, I guess maybe, I don't know if I was into any particular scene, not hardcore or anything like that. And, uh, and not really necessarily the punk scene or the hardcore punk scene or anything. So like, I can't relate to going to a show and having to like mosh with a bunch of Nazis or anything like that and everything. Cause there's obviously two different like kind of factions in punk, you know, there is that Nazi side as well. I am aware of that. Um, and the swastikas and all that kind of shit and not necessarily different kind of groups and within that and all that kind of shit. So anyways, they play that song and, uh, they're getting ready to leave and then they witness something they shouldn't witness and they're held against their will and things go from bad to worse. When Patrick Stewart shows up, they realize the cops aren't coming and they're going to kill everybody in here to hide some things. Um, they decide to fight back and bloodshed ensues some of the other people kind of change their sides or or appear or stuff they don't appear to be so, uh, and some people that you expect to last longer than they you, or that you think they would or they should like you're like well this person technically on paper should live a lot longer than they do and they don't and they die in such kind of I don't want to say unceremoniously because the movie is not, a, you know, it's not like your typical action movie where there's heroics and everything like that. So it's unceremoniously, and I don't, I usually mean that as an insult, kind of right. Like, oh, well, in Death Gas, and they unceremoniously kill a couple of the people in the movie that have been in the whole film and they should have an emotional impact. Here, I, I mean it as a compliment because it's just like, well, this is kind of the deal where it's like violence is violent and people die and it's not 
aesthetically pleasing sometimes it's just oh well, they stabbed him a few times and let him lay on the ground to bleed out and it's just unpleasant as fuck like it bothered me like i was like shit man i don't want that person got killed right there and there there's in these decent touches in here too like of uh there is emotional touches in here it's not like it's devoid of emotional emotion but uh, i ended up really really liking it this time around uh, quite a bit actually so uh give give movies a second chance let it sit a while go back couple years check it out especially if it's from somebody that usually impresses you or you hear a lot of people that you trust speak speak well of it but uh yeah i really like this one i really did and 2015 was a banger for movies for horror films and, and genre films in general yeah just the good stuff um and uh scary as shit uh, yeah <laughs> being in that situation because it feels kind of real feels like like there's a moment where it kind of sets in where it's like we're going to die or we're going to have, you know, and then when people actually die, it also kind of shocks you. And Imogen, uh, I always say her name wrong. Uh, Imogen, um, is it Imogen? Imogen. Imogen. I always say Imogen Potts name wrong, but our poots. Yeah. But she's great in this. Uh, I like her kind of, um, the scene spoiler here with big Justin where like, um, the jiu jitsu guy has him out. Reese has the guy out and, Instead of like just keep choking him out, she just takes the box cutter and casually goes up his stomach like that, and then you see her face. Just great stuff. Uh, yeah. So, anyways, um, Macon Blair too. Um, this dude should be in every movie. Macon Blair is such a good actor, su such a great actor. Um, ever since I saw him in uh, Murder Party, I just love this guy. Um, he's so funny. If anybody hasn't seen Murder Party, do yourself a favor. It's just a treat. It's very very funny. Um, even the bloopers. Watch the bloopers too. That's a, I'm a, it's a favorite of mine. So, anyways, uh, green room. A lot better this time around. Enjoyed it. Okay, this next one is a Patreon pick, and bear with me here. This is an Indian film. This is Garash or Guza Arsh or Guza Ish. Yes, this is from uh, I believe my friend Jason Willard. So he picked this one. This is a Bollywood film. It stars uh, a guy who's kind of a heartthrob. He's like he looks like the Indian Paul. Uh, what the hell is that name? Jeez, uh, Paul. Not Paul. Who's that guy? Who the hell is the guy I'm thinking of? Uh, Bradley Cooper. Bradley Cooper. He looks like an Indian Bradley Cooper to me. Um, and I've seen him in a, a couple other Indian movies. Well, one for sure that uh, Jason picked. It's an action film. And he's kind of a big heartthrob kind of action star in that film. So this is kind of an interesting take for him. This is a weird film. Um, it's a drama. Um, and it follows a story of a once famous magician who's been crippled, a, para, a quadriplegic for all four. And he's been kind of, you know, confined to uh, a wheelchair where everybody has to push him or bed or anything like that. And he does like a talk show, radio show from his house where he inspires other quadriplegic people to kind of, you know, embrace life and do, do their best. And he keeps a positive attitude. And then one day he kind of drops a bombshell on his be one of his best friends, who's also a lawyer, that he wants to die. He wants to go to the courts in India and fight for a euthanasia. So that's what he wants and he just really needs it. And, and at first you're like, well, I mean, yeah, he's a quadriplegic and I don't blame him for it, but it seems like he's well off and, and he has some, some things going on. But as it goes on and on, like his life gets worse and worse and you learn more about him. And then you're kind of just like, well, I kind of side with the guy. Like I really kind of think he, and I know this is messed up to take a stance on this and the movie kind of, I feel like it does kind of want you to take a stance in some ways. And about euthanasia or suicide in general, I, I mean, everybody has, a, I, I'm sure everybody in this life has experienced somebody who has at least committed suicide, right? Or, or somebody that has attempted or, or somebody that's wanted to die when they were very sick, something like that. So um, it brings me back to, and I don't know why I'm going to go on a rant here, when they had that newscaster when Robin Williams killed himself and that guy went on this rant about being selfish. And I honestly think that, fuck you, dude. Go fuck yourself. You don't know shit until you're in that situation. You don't know shit until you're that person. So I know that I don't like condone it, of course, or anything like that. It's obviously very unpleasant for anyone around who has to live with it. But just don't say stuff like that. Like, just keep your mouth shut. Like, nobody cares. Like, I'm sorry this dude went on this rant. Maybe he has personal experiences. Well, I do too. So, yeah, I, I just hated that. Like, anybody that just, like, wants to judge somebody like that. Like, the only time I've ever experienced suicide is I don't hate the person that did it. I just miss them. Like, I just want them back. That's how it is, you know? I don't want to get into it. 
So, uh, anyways, this it, it opens this interesting point where they're obviously kind of trying to make a political statement here in India that they're trying to obviously do the hallucination and all that kind of stuff. And obviously, it, it, it's a, it's a weird movie because it has this serious subject matter, and the lead guy is very joking with people, but also obviously he's going through a lot of mental pain. And, and you like see all these, the one thing that's kind of cheesy about the movie is they'll keep like bringing in new characters every 30 minutes, even though the movie's about two hours. So they're like, well, his mother will come in, even though she was in one flashback. And then like a former lover will call in and then like a person that he knew from his past will call in. And then this person's connected with this person. You're like, eh, I don't know about all that. It, and then it has like, it also has this cheesy kind of like lifetime quality about it, which also is a little too eye rolling at times. But then at the same time, the movie still manages to garner like an impact like an emotional impact from me where i was very depressed and very sad and like this weird bittersweet feeling but also very depressed and i i, I could see people taking this the wrong way like you should never show like somebody like euthanasia this positive for sad points but also this sad and i don't know but in certain circumstances i feel like the movie is trying to tell you in certain circumstances can you blame someone for wanting this really um but there's a whole court procedural thing here which uh and all that kind of stuff. There is like flashbacks of him doing magic on stage and other things like that. Uh, so like anyways, uh, anybody that I, I don't, like I said, I don't really want to get into the whole idea itself or my personal beliefs about it, but it does force people to probably bring this question up to themselves. Like in that situation, how would you feel about it? There is a, there is a nice situation, a uh, nice scene where he has a, a conversation with a priest and everything like that, and he he kind of has a couple jokes at his expense, which I kind of enjoyed in in the movie because of some of the stuff, just how it is, like it's just so weird for somebody to tell you these things and doesn't know what you're experiencing, right? It's just kind of it's it's so weird, like it's a situation I never like to tell people, I never do. I know what you're going through. It's just hard. I, I, I won't let that be said by me it's it, I, I i just tell people i'm sorry like you always want to in bad situations say i know what you're going through i understand you don't nobody really does only that person can even if it's the same similar circumstance nobody uh does feelings the same way or 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 think anything like that so it's just i just i you know you want to tell them that you do and you feel sorry for them and you can relate and everything and but you just i never want to overstep my boundaries either at the same time uh, anyways, I, I feel like it's an interesting film. I feel like it's well acted, well made, although a bit cheesy yet impactful all at the same time. Um, I'm not going to try to say the name again because I can barely pronounce my own name. But anyways, an interesting watch for sure. It's on Netflix if you're interested. Okay, we're going to hop into those 1970 watches. Though sometimes beaten back, he came again and again against the enemy. Till at the end he came alone from the bloody field. For he alone triumph. This was a Dracula deed. In President Nixon ordered American troops into Cambodia. He called it an incursion, not an invasion. It lasted for two months. The purpose was to destroy enemy bases and supply lines. At times, that mission was extremely dangerous. Marcus Welby, MD, and the Dick Cavett Show will not be seen tonight so that we may bring you live cover coverage of the 40 the Jimi Hendrix experience is over. The acid rock musician died today in a London hospital, apparently from an overdose of drugs. Headquarters in Washington, I'm Howard K. Smith. I'm Harry Reasoner in New York. These are tonight's headlines. Rail service across the nation is crippled by the continuing strike of the Railway Clerks Union. President Nixon meets with newsmen in his first nationally televised news conference since late July. Defense counsel says that Lieutenant Calley had orders from higher up to kill every living thing in July. And Secretary of State Rogers pledges that American troops will not be sent back into Cambodia. Howard? Reports tonight on the rail strike from Gregory. And after she let the devil fornicate with her, making the men impotent. All right, the first 1971 is a TV movie, and there's a handful of those, including uh, Crow Haven Farm, and uh, there's another one, I think. Is, is Robin Redbreast? I guess that counts as a TV film. <coughs> Sorry. This one is The House That Would Not Die, and this is put out by Kino Lorber, and uh, yeah, this stars Barbara Stanwyck is the name that popped out to me, but there's also Richard Egan, Michael Anderson Jr., and Kitty Wynn, and uh, Kitty Wynn, I believe I've seen in other things. It's a very familiar face, so... 
The House That Would Not Die. First and foremost, I'll say this about the movie. Uh, Kino did a great job cleaning this one up. And this is not like the most overly exciting film. But in 1970, the idea, the plot, the themes, all that kind of stuff was probably a lot more fresher is than somebody from 2021 watching it for the first time. So uh, saying that, it is a good film. Also saying uh, it had really likable characters. Everybody in the movie I liked. I liked all four of the main characters in the film. I liked all the actors. I thought everybody did a very good job. They came across very, you know, not friendly and good natured even when they were going crazy or being possessed so the plot is essentially this this woman inherited this house which kind of reminds me of crowhaven farm right kind of an inheritance which is a generic kind of thing to go to i inherited this and it's something's wrong with it right we're gonna find out what so she inherits this house she moves in with her niece and right away um it, things don't seem exactly right, but the house is beautiful. Some of the neighbors come over to visit and have like a housewarming deal. And Richard Egan is this kind of guy. Uh, he's a professor. And I love his first e entrance into the house because he kind of shows up when he shouldn't be. And he walks in. And he's like, I'm just here to kind of welcome you. And he's just like, he's looking around. He's obviously infatuated with the house. And that performance is great. And he's just like, I've always wanted to know what was in here. I felt like I belonged. And it's just setting that whole thing up. But his performance is probably one of my favorites because he, he, um, it's just, he's like masculine, but not overly like putting it on and just like a douchebaggery kind of way. He just seems like, you know, the quintessential 70s kind of strong older man type, but not putting it on. Like, I like this guy. I like his performance and everything. So oh, over time, they, they decided to do a seance one night, which is... I would never do a seance. And it's kind of funny. Like, it seems like all these, like, like, you know, people that are kind of like, um, I don't want to say upper crust, maybe a little bit, but like, like a little bit classy. And they're just like, yeah, we're going to do a seance. It's very cool. And it's just like, I'm like, I wouldn't even do a seance. They're like, we're going to do a seance. Guys, like, we're not, we're not doing a fucking seance. All right. I'm not doing a seance in the house. We're not doing it. We're not doing it. No seance. House is big enough and weird enough. We're not doing a seance. And I'm not even a superstitious person, but I guess when it comes to that stuff, I get a little superstitious. Like, why? Why? Why are we doing this? Obviously, trying. They're trying to communicate with somebody who had passed and everything. But what they do do is they get everybody possessed. A couple of people possessed in the house, and over time, some people's possess. You start changing their personality without ruining too much. The movie has a great uh, use of wind. They use wind a lot. You know, so when you hear that wind, the doors kick open. <sighs> It's also got the thing where it's like, well, that part of the house is boarded up. We've seen that in Amityville later on or anything. You know, like the, the Beyond, I think, even has a part of the house where it's boarded up. Like I say this a, a million times over, if you're in a horror movie or you think you're in a horror-like situation and part of the house is boarded up and you can't get to it, don't fucking go in there. No, it's, not, it's nothing you want to see. Although in this one, maybe it is something you want to see because it kind of solves the problem. Or the changeling, you know, hell. Uh, George has got dug into the fucking ground to find out what he was looking for. But anyways, this is a really well-made, well-shot, well-acted, um, fairly well-written TV movie with likable cast and likable characters. I would recommend checking it out. I enjoyed myself. If I would have saw this on TV, if I was older and I would have saw this on TV, this would be a perfect kind of Halloween night movie to watch with the entire family and dig it and be a little scared. So I liked it. Um, it's a good film. Well shot, too, like I said, especially for a TV movie. You have some of the voyeuristic stuff, which is early for 1970, although I'm sure it dates back to like some of the first movies ever made, if you think about it. I'm sure you could predate almost everything that people are like dating in movies. Like, well, the first slasher was, was Black Christmas. You're like, eh, I don't know about that. What about this scene? This is a lot like a slasher scene. And it's just like, you go back. Like, it's like, it's hard to like timestamp any birth of anything, right? But anyways, The House That Would Not Die, liked it. Um, digging the TV movies that uh, Kino is putting out. Um, I do like TV horror films, uh, especially from the 70s and 80s. I'll, I'll watch any horror film. From like 1900 to night to 2000, I'd probably say maybe let's say 96. I'll watch any horror film from that time, and I'll watch anything newer too. I'll watch any horror film, but I have my preference, right? 60s, 70s, 80s, early 90s. That's that's just my sweet spot for for horror films, and I like the Universal stuff too. So I guess anything before 96 <laughs> is my sweet spot. And I know that makes me sound like an old because I do like a lot of newer films and too, especially this time we've had from 2010 to 2000. I bet 2020 has been really good, good too. There's a lot of good stuff in there. Okay, this next one I'll be rather brief with. This is Bigfoot from 1970. That's right, Bigfoot. 
Um, and I guess there was earlier movies with Sasquatches in them, but uh, I think this was kind of one that 1970 kind of kickstarted a lot of Sasquatch movies coming out, or Bigfoot movies. I know that Legend of Boggy Creek came after this one, and that one kind of helped boost it more. But we got Bigfoot here, and this has uh, the Mitchum kids in it, or is it Mitchum uh, brother, and then uh, Chris Mitchum is also in the movie, Robert Mitchum's son. But it also has John Carradine. That's probably the number one reason I watched it, and I wanted to see kind of an earlier Bigfoot film, see how see what it was all about. So, okay, Bigfoot, uh, like I said, that's probably about all. I don't have much to say about it. So, essentially, um, uh, John Carradine and a friend of his are like these traveling salesmen, kind of uh, whatever, find money, you know, schemers, basically. Whatever they can find money, they'll do it and, and, and benefit from it. And um, Chris Mitchum is a biker. His girlfriend is abducted by a Sasquatch. And it turns out there's a group of Sasquatches out there all abducting women and mating with them. I'm not making this up. Or seemingly want to mate with them and then have offspring that are half Sasquatches that make really goofy sounds whenever they're walking around. This whole movie looks like it's shot on a set. It doesn't look like it's shot on location. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. Most of it looks like it's shot on a set, especially when the Sasquatches are there. But uh, so anyways, the biker group and everybody's trying to find the girls and they encounter the Sasquatches. That's all I have to say about the movie. I, I vaguely remember anything else, except I did enjoy John Carradine, kind of him wandering through the woods, being like, uh, telling the other guys, like, well, you better hurry up. You got to speed up. You're too slow, and all that kind of stuff. And whatever. I like John Carradine. He's a classic actor. He does a good job in almost everything he's in. He's an icon. So, like, if you throw one of those icons, uh, I'm going to watch it, especially from one of the retro years that we're on. Uh, anyways, this is not a great film. It's not an absolutely miserable film either. It's just not that interesting to me and i know that a lot of people love the sasquatch films and it picked up later on but yeah so the plot alone is hilarious to think like yeah sasquatches are kidnapping uh young and beautiful women to mate with them in the woods it's not as graphic it's not really graphic at all there's a lot of stuff of like these girls like just dressed in pretty dresses with their makeup intact everything on a tree like what do you think they're gonna do with us it's like i don't know i think they're gonna mate with us well oh no I'm going to stand here and not do anything. I just, I don't know. Like, just like It's just goofy. Uh, not a horrible movie. It's just Bikers vs. Bigfoot. Not as exciting. Not as, a, as, a, as explicit. Explicit. <laughs> I can't even say that word. Ah, man. I'm going to cut my tongue off. Explicit as one would think. So Bigfoot. Okay, this next one here from 1970 is the third Jess Franco I'm covering from 1970, and this is Eugenie. Um, this is uh, based on the story of her journey into perversion. This is based on the Marquise de Sade, and I guess this one isn't as, uh, as uh, you know, doesn't go exactly where Marquise de Sade went. Um, the cast in here, let me, before I forget, it has, uh, I'll never say this actress's name, uh, Mary, a little Jean doll, who's actually in Dorian Gray, which we're also covering this week. She plays Dorian Gray's girlfriend. Then we have Mary Rom, who pops up in, of course, um, Count Dracula by Jess Franco. Jack Taylor pops up in Count Dracula by Jess Franco and a slew of other Euro horror films, including some bigger titles um, like Conan. I believe he's in Conan the Barbarian, but he's also in um, Rest in Pieces by Jose Larraz, which I covered, and uh, just a lot of Jess Franco movies. And then, of course, Christopher Lee, which is, this is the third 1970 movie by Jess Franco with Christopher Lee, including The Bloody Judge and Count Dracula. So, Eugenie, this one's not bad. Very short film. Uh, it also has Dr. Seward in here from Count Dracula. So, essentially what it is, is Jack Taylor and Maria Rahm are two brother and sister who manipulate a situation where they can get this beautiful young girl to show up on this island with her so they can basically uh, be sexually sexual deviants with her, have sex with her, manipulate her, make her see hallucinations, and possibly indoctrinate her into this weird weird, crazy Marquise de Sade cult, where, I don't want to spoil that, but yeah, there's this, eh, I'm not going to even go there. So anyways, uh, they start to kind of manipulate her, do all these sexual depraved things to her, have sex with her, kind of tell her that she's having these nightmares and all these head games and everything like that. It's shot in a beautiful location, which seems to be the kind of the MO with, you know, Jess Frankel had a lot of those places with gorgeous locations that kind of makes up for sometimes if their budgets were constrained or everything like that. Uh, explicit nudity, uh, a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of uh, uh, full frontal from female and everything that's yeah so there's that um 
And of course, Christopher Lee shows up with a group of Marquise de Sade people that want to kind of uh, indoctrinate her and do all sorts of things. There's a twist at the very end of the film, which kind of sets it a little bit more into the horror oriented world here. But uh, yeah, uh, I can't. In the opening, uh, Maria is like manipulating um, Eugenie's father. And I'm just like, how could anybody go for this? Like, he's getting like sex and he's just like, you're not going to hurt her. Like, let's these two people take her to a, a island so they can fuck her for sex i don't know how anybody could be that horny to allow that to happen right but uh it looks really good uh blue underground cleaned it up quite a bit and that's why i said like it's it's so funny like you'll see some of the other companies tackle a movie from 1970 and like it's like this doesn't look very great the blu-ray doesn't play right but then like somebody like blue underground or vinegar syndrome will touch it and you're like this looks great this looks fantastic so uh eugenie has some special features on here including interview with Jess Franco, producer Harry Allen Towers, and stars Maria Le, Le Joel-Hall and Christopher Lee, and then Stephen Thrower on Eugenie, interview uh, with the author Murderous pa Passions, the delirious cinema of Jess Franco. Also includes a DVD and a CD in this release. So yeah, it's one of these three-disc ones. I doubt this is going to get a 4K later down the line from uh, Blue Underground. I, I just don't see. Um, but it would be nice to see a Jess Franco in 4K. That'd be awesome. Um, anyways, Eugenie, a solid 19 1970 movie uh, more exploitation but a little bit horror in there as well okay the next one from 1970 is the weekend murders and i believe this was a uh, made in britain by italian people this is an italian film definitely feels like it's an italian film and let me see the actors and actresses in here anna mofo is in here she's in a slew of these and evelyn seward is in here as well and the last one uh beryl cunningham i'll mention her because she's actually in um, Dorian Gray uh, as well. So this one, I, it's listed sometimes as a Giallo parody or Jelly parody, Giallo parody, whatever you guys want to say. And within the first five minutes, I was like, this is definitely going at it as a comedic kind of route. 1970, I guess it would be, you know, it says Giallo spoof, but it's weird because Bird with the Crystal Plumage came out the same freaking year. So would it be a spoof? It's definitely a comedy and kind of the murder mystery Agatha Christie kind of styles, which is funny because it is this is the most generic gothic story ever. It's like, well, we're here because so-and-so died and we're waiting to read the will and people are going to get picked off. It's just like, you know, obviously uh, it's the most generic. And, and the Knives Out even kind of was like, you know, obviously a more comedic version of that film. And it just took like the most generic thing. If there's a will and a big mansion and people are getting picked off, that is gothic 101, you know what I mean? Or Agatha Christie, you know, stuff too. Uh, and this does have the giallo kind of flares, especially... Um, with that but the plot like the actors and characters act mostly straightforward every once in a while there'll be a comedic beat bet between them but for the most part the playfulness and the goofiness where somebody would say this is a spoof which i do see that a spoofy kind of thing is in the camera work and the editing and the sound design so um in the very beginning they're playing golf and there's a body kind of discovered when one of the uh, animofa hits off the golf ball and you see a hand under the sand. And then it all of a sudden goes and zooms in on every character. like, And with these sounds like, bend, bend. And the music kind of plays in there. And it's just like very done into comedic effect. Over the top, you know what I mean? Like, And if you watch a lot of Italian cinema, they'll always zoom in, whip pan to the eye. Or zoom in on the eye. Or, or all that kind of stuff, right? But this one is hitting the music cues and being like comedic about it. And it does it to everybody. And it seems like it does it multiple times. So that was the scene that happened, and then we kind of jump back in time, and where the police detective who has these fake teeth and looks really goofy, obviously comedic kind of character, is like, let's take it back to the beginning, three days ago when we read the will. And then we kind of go back, and all the characters are there, and all the characters show up, and they're all character types, and boom, they start getting picked off, right? Kind of slow. There isn't that much action. The body count's not tremendously high. And at first you could see this more as a, a Jiali whore type, but as it goes on, it, it's just definitely more of the... Uh, uh, I don't even want to say like murder mystery kind of deal, more mystery style um, with some comedic flares, especially the stuff with the mother and son and his kind of weird perversities and his kind of mental breakdown and everything like that. Um, the reveal is kind of fun, kind of, kind of quirky how it all ends up. The music I do enjoy, um, but it, there's some, some, downtime on here that's kind of just was like i'm a little bored without and that's probably my attention span but i do find the movie interesting for its its use of the camera like in a comedic playful way because like italian cinema always has the playful camera but just the way this is edited and done for it it feels a comedic especially in the first act and then it kind of loses a lot of that as it goes on um they remastered it fairly well this is a code red disc no subtitles which kind of bummed me out but uh yeah 
Uh, this is a lot less horror film than one would expect, but that's not a problem. I'm just covering a lot of horror films at the time. Um, yeah, this, this is, if you're into these like kind of murder mysteries, gothic style, then check this one out. Um, a lot of people compare it to Clue. I don't think it's as outwardly funny uh, or as clear clever as clue but it's still still entertaining enough okay this next one from 1970 is blood mania and vinegar syndrome put this out as a double feature with point of terror which i think they're both crowned international pictures so uh okay blood mania is a is a fairly short 120 minute horror film mm, horror film i guess i'll use in quotations i guess there's some stuff in here that makes it horror enough um yeah so anyways i put this one in it's kind of like a family drama situation, gothic kind of money needing deal. So uh, the main character in here, there's a couple main characters. There's a doctor here who's desperate for $50,000. He's being blackmailed. He's taking care of this kind of uh, rich guy who runs this kind of uh, resort or, or like kind of a clinic where this doctor works at. And this doctor's daughter is uh, a nymphomaniac. She's she's crazy obsessive weird and she's infatuated with this doctor and she obviously has some trauma um the trauma is kind of shown and flashbacks or weird dreams that get all psychedelic where there's a lot of colors and everything and and you kind of get idea that she has some sexual trauma maybe involving a family member and everything like that so uh what happens here is through this circumstance um she learns that her friend, the doctor, needs some money, and she decides to do something awfully stupid to get it. Uh, it kind of backfires in her face, and, and uh, more people come to visit, and she carries out you know, an, uh, even another murder. And I don't, I don't want to spoil too much. When the murders are carried out, they're pretty crazy, especially the one goes completely bonkers and over the top. The camera gets real weird. And actually, the director said that when he was had it edited or shooting, he said one shot would be high, and the next would be low. And if it was this one was stationary, the next one would have to be moving, so the cut, so it makes it freaking bonkers on purpose you know makes it unsettling um i like uh the performance of most of the actors in the film i think that the the uh the doctor who runs the clinic who's sick is, is good i think that the main guy the main doctor guy is really solid he's got a leading man look a chiseled look um and i think that um the uh the character here who kind of the nymphomaniac is also great she's also gorgeous on top of that um, it, it's a good looking cast and they, they let you know that too, because there's at least, uh, three sets of breast. <laughs> it's like, and of course the, the leading man has to kind of have sex with all of them. Uh, there's a, a couple knocks here. Kind of, they bring this one, a blackmailing character back at, here and there in spots. And, and the wife of the one character is kind of like not utilized in the third act, which I thought was strange. Um, the flashes of, uh, the kind of the nightmare dream sequences are pretty whore pretty crazy and the murder sequences the one of them in particular is pretty nasty uh yeah so uh, this is a decent film i was happy with it uh, they remastered it fairly well it looks really good um there's a director's commentary on there also with one of the actresses or i believe two of the actresses on here uh vicky peters and leslie sims leslie sims plays this nurse in here she she has a good enjoyable role um yeah and Vicky Peters, I think she also, she, she played the wife. So anyways, uh, there's also an interview with um, director Robert Vincent Neal and with actress Leslie Sims. So they kind of talk about the movie a bit. Anyways, it's enjoyable on here. Um, I don't think it's anything like mind-blowing, but uh, the advertisement also, I think, made people think it was more of a gratuitous horror film than it actually was. But um, I wouldn't say it's not a horror film. There's some good imagery in here, some some cool stuff, but and it's short and sweet and kind of to the point, so that's Blood Mania. Remastered well. Vinegar Syndrome did a good job with it, but when do they not? Okay, the next one from 1970 is Hollywood Whorehouse, a.k.a. Savage Intruder. And I had seen this a long ago, long ago on kind of a bootlegged disc, kind of like a gray market DVD that looked like shit, to be honest. So this is kind of, again, an old bitty kind of meets a, a scuzzy serial killer storyline. And I actually saw a very funny letterbox review that said, get your scuzzy serial killer out of my old bitty movie. And I was like, it's about right. So what we have here is an aging actress um, in, in, in kind of line with Sunset Boulevard, which is a movie that I've never seen, but I've heard reference and I know the story so much that everybody points it out. I know like the plot of the film, you know, old aging actress has a houseboy. That's kind of the deal here, right? So, which is on my blind spot. I definitely need to get to that movie. I bought the Blu-ray to watch it and I should have watched it about a year ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. So uh, it's kind of that line. Uh, this obviously... Kind of inspired also by stuff like Whatever Happened to Baby Jane. So we have this actress, Miriam Hopkins, who I'm not too familiar with, but uh, David Dakota and David Deval, who do the commentary, uh, state that she was a fairly well-known actress at her time. 
um, and a good actress too. So uh, she's isolated in this house. She's an alcoholic. She's being taken care of by one of her, I, I guess it would be kind of a, a lifelong friend, also a nurse and uh, uh, I think a cook or a house, house sitter kind of. There's a group of people there. Um, we know in Hollywood, because uh, it's in Hollywood, we know that there's a serial killer going around. And right in the beginning, we see like the Hollywood decrepit sign and underneath we pan down and we see this body mangled in the sand. We know that there's this person focusing on killing middle-aged women, kind of similar to Albert DeSalvo, right? We go with that, uh, the Boston Strangler, uh, killing these middle-aged women. And we actually witness one of the murders, which is, it's really unpleasant watching these like sad middle-aged people be killed brutally by this guy. Um, and it reminds me a little bit of Golden Glove watching that too. It's just unpleasant as hell. Much more unpleasant than Golden Glove because that one's just like trying to go for realism and it's just sickening. So, Anyways, uh, we, we kind of know this guy right away. We know the killer. He goes on one of these Hollywood tour buses, and it's actually led by uh, Joe Besser, uh, one of the three students. Is it Joe Besser? It's one of the... Th uh, is it... It's not... It's Joe Besser. It's one of the Three Stooges. Not one of the main Three Stooges or Shemp, but one of the replacements like Curly Joe or Joe Besser, I think. Anyways, one of those guys, uh, I remember they pointed out in the commentary, I was like, oh, that's interesting as hell that it's one of the uh, other Stooges. Um, kind of doing the, the bus tour where they used to do these things where they drive around the city in uh, Hollywood and point out, well, this is where so-and-so lives or this is where uh, so-and-so was at old Hollywood tours. And the serial killer's on there. We know it's him, right? We've already seen him. He hops off. He ends up walking up to the house and at the same time, they're looking for a a home and nurse to take care of uh, Marion Hopkins, but he kind of goes in there and takes it and says he's here from the registry, the agency, and everything like that. And infiltrates the kind of place. With, within minutes, within like minutes in the movie, he's just a obnoxious asshole, and he kind of infiltrates and gains the uh, gazer gains her trust and kind of you know sleeping around and everything, and uh, starts to manipulate everyone. But of course, when people find out, they gotta go gotta go when they find out he's not who he says he is or there's something wrong with him or they're going to tell on him um there's this pretty crazy scene where they take her out uh he takes her out to this 70s club where we have kind of old hollywood meeting this crazy kind of 1970s uh counterculture culture uh clash here where we have all these 70s kind of weirdo people um i see weirdos like you know kind of just strange people oddities like uh drug pushers all that kind of stuff I'm meeting her and she's enjoying herself and they bring her back to like the house and they're trashing it and all the people that are currently taking care of her or lived there for a long time are upset about it so that's kind of a wild crazy scene there's also an insane scene where she goes to do this Christmas parade, which has some really unfortunate circumstances, uh, unfortunate events for her, which she says some things that she obviously shouldn't. But uh, yeah, uh, anyways, uh, it gets almost on, on accidentally comedic where like they like, use a mannequin at certain points where you're like, come on, man. But, uh, yeah, I don't oh, know. I think this is a pretty good film. I do like the flashes that the serial killer has kind of like blood mania. And that one where you have the, the, the person that obviously is suffering from mental derangement, having these flashes of the past, all in these weird psychedelic seventies colors. And this is the same kind of deal here where the lead character kind of like similar to hatchet for the honeymoon, where we have like this idea of everything that's possibly these little bits and pieces until we eventually kind of know exactly what happened here, where we have the lead character has some mommy issues um and everything like that and uh there's a flash where a hand gets hacked off and again it's all super psychedelic and weird also reminds me of something like nightmare and a damaged brain that would kind of take from that aka nightmare so it's very typical in that way it has shares dna with blood mania and hatchet for the honeymoon from the same year um although somebody did tell me that this was 73 although internet movie database listed as 1970 and i don't i can't really find anything else about it just looking on the sites and everything so sometimes we go by internet movie database i know it's not always accurate in comparison when everything exactly was released so anyways I, I enjoyed this one i thought it was decent this was a second time watch uh being remastered and cleaned up helped quite a bit uh yeah the lead character is just an overall piece of shit i felt bad for all the victims in this one you know they're not like people are like yeah get him it's just like a lot of you know a, a kind of a wimpy egotistical jerk off killing older women it's just it's not on it's, it's, it's not pleasant uh the commentary by uh, david dakota and david Deval, which I, I hear them say their name a hundred times and i always pronounce their names wrong sorry um is fun uh these guys are um uh, david Deval seems to be a fan of the movie and knows more about the film and the history while david dakota seems like the first time he's watching and they always bounce back and forth and they get kind of catty about a lot of things they, they're very funny and um at one point Deval does this funny uh impersonation of curtis harrington who was a friend of theirs he's a director did a bunch of these old bitty movies and slew of other movies um queen of queen of space was one of his if i'm not mistaken and the killing kind by with john savage 
So um, they do an impersonation of that, which is funny. So anyways, good commentary, good film. I know a lot of people don't love this one, but I think it's a kind of a fun movie from 1970. Yeah, so Hollywood Whorehouse, a.k.a. Savage Intruder. What? What is this? Zombie Bloodbath 2, Rage of the Undead. Oh. What? You ain't seen Zombie Bloodbath 2, Rage of the Undead? Nah, I guess I must have missed that one. You ain't seen nothing. You ain't seen nothing. I've seen way more than you. Mm -hmm. You haven't seen Taxi Driver, Goodfellas, Casino, Cannibal Holocaust, The Beginning, The Great Escape, Kelly's Heroes. Once upon a time in the fucking West! You haven't seen War and Peace, Pink Flamingo, Casablanca, <laughs> Gone with the Wind, Citizen Game, The Alvin and the Chipmunks Christmas Special. You haven't seen, hmm, what else haven't you seen? The Magnificent Seven? The Magnificent Seven Ride Again? The Magnificent Seven Are Back? Is that a movie? And last of all, you ain't seen Zombie Bloodbath 2, <laughs> Rage of the Undead. And you haven't seen War and Peace. I ain't watching War and Peace. The hell you are. Fuck War and Peace. Hey guys, we're here for You Ain't Seen. And this time I picked one for Jeremy from 1970, Two Birds, One Stone. This is one that I, I always had a fondness of. I only saw it the one time and, and I really dug it. So I was like... Well, rewatching it for 1970, I think that uh, Jeremy might dig this one. This is the uh, Dorian Gray, aka The Secret Life of Dorian Gray. It's an Italian picture. Uh, it's like a co-production, obviously, like 90% of Italian films. It's directed by Massimo Dallamano, who did last week's Banditos, the Spaghetti Western. But he also did a couple Gialli, um, What Have You Done to Solange, which has one of the best trailers of all time. And is one of the most sleazy and mean-spirited jealous i've ever seen he also did the sequel what have they done to our daughters which is pretty solid he did a handful of other films those ones are kind of the ones that come to mind i know he died fairly young this stars helmut berger who um was in a couple big ones like the night porter but i, I mostly know him from the beast with the gun and uh, bloodstained butterfly mostly his euro kind of horror oriented stuff or, or genre cinema uh and it also stars legendary actor herbert Lom who is actually in three 1970 uh, genre-related movies, uh, horror films, including Jess Franco's Count Dracula. He's also in Mark of the Devil and Dorian Gray. He plays Harry, very right? Harry Wanton. Something? Yeah. So this is based, obviously, on the Oscar Wilde uh, book, um, Dorian Gray, which... Is it The Picture of Dorian Gray? I think the movie's actually called The Picture of Dorian Gray, uh, which is a story I'm familiar with, but I just basically knowing the story itself. I don't think I ever read that novel, which I definitely want to, especially after watching this one. Uh, this one being an Italian version, or especially a Euro one, it's very sleazy, it's very trashy, and I do not know how it compares to the actual novel. I like to feel like um, it just doesn't do any underlining things and just puts everything in your face. Well, when the movie opens, it, it does say adapted from. So, oh, yeah. it's, so we it's, know. It's, yeah. Well, it's, this, uh, it's called Dorian Gray. It has to be adapted from something. Right, right. Yeah. It, it's probably closer than most of the other fucking, like, a Dracula or Frankenstein stories adapt, adaptation goes. So the plot is basically Dorian Gray starts off in this. We meet him very young. He ends up being, like, an aristocrat. I'm not even sure what he does if he comes for money, but he's a college student. And we follow him through his life. One day, he meets this painter and um, Herbert Lom, who's kind of this rich kind of clearly like homosexual guy who puts everything in looks he has no he, he despises old age just and really despises any human like value or consciousness mm -hmm. or anything basically live like you know um the sins you know indulge in everything and he passes this on to dorian gray while he's getting this portrait completed of him um it's it's uh right when dorian sees this painting he realizes how beautiful he is and it kind of overtakes him, and on the spot, he sells his soul to remain young. And that's kind of the story here. Mm -hmm. As he does horrible things throughout the years, and everyone ages around him, he stays young and beautiful and uses his beauty to his advantage. But he has an emptiness with inside of him, and he just does whatever he wants, destroying people around him. And the painting, of course, gets uglier and uglier and uglier, driving him insane and basically making him bored with his life the end of it. see you guys next week so uh 
Helmut <laughs> Berger is perfectly cast because Helmut Berger is like a beautiful like young man. He looks very good. His features are distinguished. But unlike, he doesn't look, I don't want to say this, cute. He looks mean. He does look kind of He mean. looks like an asshole. Yeah. So <laughs> normally when you like think of somebody like you would think Dorian Gray, oh, he's so pretty. You look at uh, Dor- uh, uh, Helmut Berger and you're like, he looks pretty, but he looks like a he looks like a jerk. And even in the beginning, he like has a nativity about him. Mm-hmm. And the best part of this movie is watching Herbert Lom just like age and, and throughout and get more miserable. And the way he has these long diatrads when he's talking to him uh, and just kind of corrupt Helmut Berger until the point where he is so bad, Helmut Berger, Dorian Gray, that he is actually worse than Henry, like in, in, in his mind and everything. But I feel like at points, Harry is almost just kind of like pushing everything he would wanted to do into Dorian Gray and oh, embrace all that stuff. He does. I mean, he's very much like like the devil figure. Yeah, give vicariously or living through him, but also right. not, not necessarily... He's not like... A he, villain. Yeah, he's not a villain. He's not supernatural. I mean, he's an aging gay man who is kind of like regretting... Living his life as he did. Yeah. Some some of his dialogue, when he initially sees the painting of Dorian Gray before he meets him, like he's just like, mm, all sophisticated. And then he sees him, he's like, like it all like wipes off his face, like he's mm-hmm. just struck. Every everybody is gay, straight, no matter who they mm-hmm. are. They see Dorian Gray and they're like struck. Like he almost has gained this supernatural ability within him, and he he has right. So I mean, his problems stem early on from um, a relationship that's broken and the death, and and after that, it just gets worse and worse. And he just it is funny though, like some of the depravity so called that he's having is just mm-hmm. like some light B uh, D S uh, B S M whatever the fuck bondage stuff. What is it? Bondage submission B S D M or B D S M B DSM, I, I sorry. Know. I think it's that's the proper, uh, what are those, anagrams or whatever the fuck they are? And when you abbreviate something. I don't know. So anyways, there's some light that, and that like first is probably when the painting starts to twist. And then also the sexuality for 1970 is really pushing it because we have like a lot of a homosexual and mm-hmm. heterosexual relationships. Um, and there's a decent amount of nudity. I mean, yeah. the, the movie's really drooling over Helmut Berger a lot, but there is some female nudity in here and everything. Mm-hmm. And like I said, really the movie is just watching uh, Herbert Lop get more embittered. And the lights he says, he's like, oh. <laughs> like, uh, uh, Herbert Lom wasn't a, a homosexual person in real life, so seeing him play like this aristocratic gay guy is just like a, a tour de force performance. And it's in such a sleazy movie, like a movie that most people would consider trash. I love trash, so this is one of my favorite movies from 1970 surprise surprise but he's just like uh how do you stay so i shouldn't even spoil any of this but i'm gonna because we've spoiled these 10 mm-hmm. units he's like how can you stay so young what's your secret dorian gray when i see old lovers they're all fat and bloated and disgusted <laughs> it's just so cruel the stuff he says it just makes me laugh because it's so um i mean like everybody gets that idea nobody wants to get old and that's another <coughs> thing that's always kind of um I've always been scared of is getting old. I think that's a typical thing, especially someone who exercises a lot. Like no matter what you do, no matter how hard you try, it just, (laughs) you get old. You can't stop it. And uh, here's a funny little story. Today I got my hair cut, as you can tell. And uh, (laughs) I don't know how it came up. I just said, I look old for my age. And uh, the the barber was like, hmm, I'm like, she just guessed my age, which I didn't ask her to do. And she was like 42. (laughs) I was like, holy shit, I'm 34. She guessed me eight years older. That's a lot. It's a decade. I looked a decade older than um, than I am. And it's, just, it's not the first person to guess that I'm older. Most people think I'm older. Generally, my personality mm-hmm. seems like an old man. The people, A lot of my friends call me old man. They mess with me about that. I work with a bunch of old guys. so it's just And, and I look old as shit because... I, I call you grandpa. Yeah, man. people call me grandpa. That's just the way it is. So, uh, yeah, this one really connected with me. The story connects with me in general. And it, another scene, um, I brought this up last week when we talked about Lilo and Stitch, is something wicked this way comes. One of my all-time favorite scenes in that movie mm-hmm. is when Jonathan Price is, um, again, kind of a similar story here uh, with Jason Robards in the library. And he's basically trying to sell him his youth. And he's like, 35, going once, 35, gone. Uh, pro- the, the, that's my favorite scene in the whole movie. It's, it's a genuinely amazing scene. Uh, but yeah, this one, it's also really like amazing set pieces. It looks beautiful. Um, it's well shot. It's, mm-hmm. it's well, um, the music's good. And music's like, good. it looks like rich people shit because it, and just a lot of beautiful people eating beautiful things. But there's a lot of also old people mingling with the beauty and stuff. You can try to leech off them and stuff. And there's some good comedic puns too with the horse lady. 
comedic puns? Not a pun, but of kind of a visual pun. Oh yeah, if yeah, you there, will, there's a part where she basically studs out horses, and she's right. talking about this horse being studded, and he's basically being prostituted out mm-hmm. by her, um, Herbert Lom to make this deal and stuff, and it's obviously in you know, but not even lightly. This is straightforward, but she's like hanging over like the horse. Uh, Stable, oh, getting, stable, and she's getting know, she's bowed, getting... and some guy walks by, like "Good day." And she's like, "Oh, <laughs> <laughs> clearly, um, some visual stuff there that Dorian Gray is pretty much the horse, the oh, stud, yeah. and everything, and right. banging everyone around him." Yeah, you know, and and like as much as the movie is about like not growing old, it's also about like not living with consequence. Um, Yolo, and, and <laughs> so you know, he he does all these things. Um, and he does all these terrible things, and he's never affected by it. And, and I think that's something that a lot of the characters point out. It's like, how do you live this lifestyle, but nothing ever comes back to you? You get away with everything. Well, it goes um, to everyone else, and eventually that bot starts to bother him. Right, you know, to the point where he, you know, he just starts committing, like, like homicide. Um, <laughs> spoiler alert. But, you know, and, you know, like, he takes the mistresses of, like, his, like, former friends, you know, just because he can... Um, I, I should point out one of his friends in this film is actually the uh, the guy from Bird with the Crystal Plumage, who's mm-hmm. like his friend expert on the birds. And this guy does not have good luck in these movies. Um, he's he's also like kind of some kind of expert scientist, biochemist or something in this film. And, and in another one, a couple years, I'll mention it again, he was in Death Late Nag, where he played, I think, mm-hmm. some sort of scientist. So this guy's in a, in a bunch of these movies like this around this time. Um, she's the uh, wife of the old guy as well as in, uh, she's in Count Dracula. So th- like there's a good cast. Um, it's well acted. Mm-hmm. Um like I said, Herbert Lom is fantastic. Um, he he's amazing. It's, Herbert it's Lom is is one the, of the best actors. The ever. highlight of this movie, and I mean, he's been the highlight of like every movie we've seen with him in it. That's why he was Count fantastic. Dracula. It's it's Lee and him are both great. Lee and, and, and him are both and great. And Klaus Kinski's really good too. Klaus, so it's, Klaus Kinski is a write off character for me in that. Just but he's he great do because anything. he's just like walking up. <laughs> but um. It's in Count Dracula. It's a little harder to be the best right. when you you're dealing with those kind of actors. But Herbert Lom is still on their caliber, if not better, sometimes. One of my my favorite scenes in this one is um, there's a montage where he's on a boat and he's <laughs> you know he's going through and like you just see all these different women like like their hand reach out and it's all and silent. Grab them. And it's music. all silent yeah. and music. You know, and it's and one like, shot too, I believe, isn't it? I think it's different shots, but okay. um, but yeah, it's like you know, it's one girl's her her hand pops out of a hallway, and grabs one, his face, and one stuff. from like behind a corner, you know, and like, and as we're watching it, it happens like three or four times. And I'm like, I'm I'm anticipating Herbert Lom's hand. I just, I'm like, like they better do it. They better show it, or this movie's not getting above two stars. And then like, there's a scene where he's showering. Um, and he drops a soap. He drops a soap, yeah. and you see Herbert Lom's like hairy hand, and he's like lathering him up. I'm like, thank you. Thank I mean, you because for doing honestly, this. Herbert Lom, this whole movie has never made a come on to him. He, no, like, his sister and uh, um, uh, Herbert Lom's sister and him and mm-hmm. Helmut Berger and everything. But you're just waiting for it eventually, and it's just like it. It was the perfect moment to reveal that. Oh yeah, it, it was fantastic. Um, it, it's a good movie. Um, and I. I I know people are like, how could they dare ruin such a thing? Like, and it's just like the, the history of Oscar Wilde. Like, this is Oscar Wilde. I, I mean, is he was a gay man back in the day, and he had like a lot of perversities, right? Mm-hmm. Like, from my understanding. So it's just like, like I mean, maybe this is more accurate to his right. real life. No, I've, I've never read. Um, um, I'm definitely gonna read. read that I've only read like a few. Li- like, I've only read a very little bit of uh, Oscar Wilde, but um, I don't know. It'd be interesting to see what he has to say about stuff. So, it is on tear on tape here. Mm-hmm. Usually you read this, but since it's not in the Creature Features book, for good reason, it's not Creature Feature, I'll read this one. And uh, it's kind of funny. Dorian Gray, one and a half out of four stars. Weird. Okay. Massimo Delamano, Helmut Berger, Herbert Lahm, Richard Todd, Margaret Lee, Maria Lajazdal, uh, Maria Romp, and Isa uh, Miranda. Um, Beryl Cunningham, who plays the African American lady in this, who's also oh, she, in in this week's movie, uh, Weekend Murders. She was really good. I really liked her character. Sexed up remake of Oscar Wilde's The Picture of Dorian Gray with Berger as the ageless aristocrat whose portrait ages and corrupts while he indulges in all sorts of decadent shenanigans. Page turn. Dumb in that the story seems to be taking place in a little more than a year or two, making one wonder why Dorian stays young and more why everyone else grows old so fast. Bad drugs, 
question mark. There's a lot of sex, both hetero and homo. Nudity, both girl and boy. And only marginal entertainment value, aka the secret of Dorian Gray. It's not secret life, it's just a secret, I guess. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, a little harsh, I think. Uh, I doubt maybe a guy who's more focused on horror wouldn't dig some Euro trash. Well, I, I, I do agree with him that it's kind of hard to tell when the time is skipping, because it's never really clear. Um, I didn't quite notice the makeup effects the first skip in because like the people that they were aging up already looked kind of old so it was like well i they, um herbert lom has dark hair in the beginning and then right. he has like light, light hair and then they thin his hair out more and more as it goes on well the, the like because i think there's like more or less like three major times because there was like a time skip that's like maybe 10 years into the future and then like again like 30 years into the future mm, i'd say maybe 10, number 20, 10 maybe, maybe it's 15. about 20 because he the one guy dies when he's 40 and they were probably twenty when they started. So it's it's there's like a it's like a ten um, skip. But I, I didn't notice the first skip right away. I should mention that um, through every time period, basically, they um, super hyper focus on the um, the outfits. So like there's going through all these stages. Right. So pe like there's like an Oriental stage like mm -hmm. at the time. So they're all wearing like Asian attire and everything. And it like whoever did like the wardrobe on this was like. They were getting their. They were getting a lot of exercise. They did a good job because eh, there's tons of changes. It's kind of funny to be honest right. to me. Do you agree? Like it's he's so like. Eh, eh. <laughs> See, Herbert Long changed different clothes throughout. Oh. I I do like the, the wardrobe changing. You know, as, as time progressed. But then at the same time, it's also the seventies and seventies had out like outlandish fashion. So I'm like. Is this a time skip, or are we all dressing like cowboys in the future? Um, <laughs> um, I also could have done without the loud disco music at times. Yeah, so, yeah. The I think the mix on this one that we watched, it, it was oh. really inconsistent. The music was really loud, and the dialogue was kind of quiet. I should also mention um, some weird thing with the Rero Blu-ray is um, I have a 4K player, and it has two HDMI inputs, one for the, the um, picture quality and one for audio only that directly goes into the sound bar, which goes into the TV, so you can get lossless audio quality, right? So you get direct. It's never done this before, ever, on any other movie if I played it. So um, if I played it on this, uh, which was, it says it's a DTS Master Audio Remix, <coughs> it never had this problem before, but the audio would not come through. It would come in messed up and all warped and everything. But then when I put it in the region-free Blu-ray Blu player, which it goes through an HDMI and then it uses eARC to go through the sound quality, everything else was fine. And I literally just watched a movie before that and a movie after that and mm -hmm. never had this problem. And DTS audio mixes as well. So my guess is that it's some way that that the Raro Blu-ray is encoded, that it's just weird. I've never experienced that. I actually went to reorder the Blu-ray to see if this one was messed up, but I switched players, I realized that it must just be the compatibility with this Raro mm -hmm. disc. And I mean, this is a, a Sony 4K player, and like the TV and uh, soundbar are new, and the soundbar is pretty much one of the last um, you know models out. So I don't know how it goes about that. Very strange, very strange indeed. It was it, it was weird. Like the menu played fine and everything with the sound, and then you went to the movie in English or Italian, it would not play. Right. Um, so I, I watched this. Of course, we watch it in English because Herbert Lom's going to be speaking and dub himself over. Well, I think most of the cast was English speaking. Most mm -hmm. everybody's lips were maybe maybe well not. speak. It's, uh, I, I, don't, I didn't notice anybody that was speaking Italian in their lip movement versus their... Well, back in the day, in the 70s and 80s and stuff, they used to dub really well in Italy. And it was like, and, and a lot of those Euro movies had really good dubbing. But then when you get later into like the 2000s, 2010s, the dubbing from Italian movies are so piss poor that right. they, they don't even bother sometimes dubbing. They, they make the actors speak in English, even if it's not their first language. And it's just as like... It, it ruins the performance. If you make an actor mm. speak in a different language they're not comfortable with... Or it doesn't, or it's like a second or third language, and they don't know what they're saying. It, sometimes it comes across really piss poor. Well, I, th I think most, I think most of the actors or, or characters in this were English speaking because their mouth lips didn't seem like they were actually speaking. Helmut Berger either. is German, but I'm sure. But he, well, he was English. speaking English. Was he? Yeah, I mean, he. I, he is Austrian, right? Where do they speak? Austria. He's from Austria. Where do they speak in Austria? I, I don't know. Australian? No, stop it. They probably speak German and maybe another language. I'm not 100%. Uh, maybe, I don't know if they have their own language in Austria. But it's weird. There's another fun fact about him is he was actually partners with uh, the famous director Visconti for a long time. So 
always like an Italian director, kind of like one of those fancy pants directors, like a Fellini or Rosalini or something like that, or Bertolucci. People that we don't typically review. I don't know. We're talking are. about Massimo Dallamano. <laughs> We're talking about somebody classy, like a sleazy class, which are my kind of jam. I'm a big fan of this movie. I'd give it a seven and a half to eight out of ten. Um, I'd give it a four out of five. Um, I, I didn't like the opening. I thought that was unnecessary. Oh, yeah. Where he's stumbling through the apartment. Because they then show it later on, shot for shot. Like, it doesn't do anything to, like, get my interest or, you know, make me, oh, what's going on? No, it, it was completely unnecessary. And it's literally a shot for shot of the last 20 minutes. So it's like, okay. Are you going to be out of town next week? I might be out of town next week. All next week? Well, I'm leaving Friday. Okay. And I won't come back till Friday. Um, so, so we're probably a... going to have to watch your movie this week and squeeze it in. We don't have time to watch it this week. Yeah, we do. We'll have to figure it out. Well, we'll have to watch it separate and then shoot the review that day. We're going to have to. We'll have to watch it separate, so you'll have to pick the movie. Well, I already, I already, I already know what we're going to make, but I don't know if we'll have time to watch it until I get back from vacation. Well, I'm just saying, you're going to have, you have to watch it on your own accord on vacation. I won't have that means. Well, you've already seen it, so you're going to no, have No, I to... don't have it. Seen. It's a blind spot for both of us. Well, you're going to have to pick something else. What? No. And we'll just do it next time. No. Yeah, we're not missing a week. Can't miss a week. We can miss a no, week. No, we can't. Well, I don't know what to tell you. What is the movie? The movie is Plan 9 from Outer Space. What the fuck? You make me watch that. Yeah. We're going to watch that. We'll it'll watch it'll it either tonight. be next week or it'll be the week. We're not doing after. it. You can't crowd in my things. You screw up the timing. Okay. Well. We're squeezing in. We're going to watch it right now and record early. I. I I don't. I don't want to <laughs> argue on, on, on recording. <laughs> I'm just so. kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. Okay, okay. so I'll uh, see you guys next week. Okay. Bye. <laughs> okay. Before we jump into these Q and A, I want to do the Patreon drawing, the Q and As. So I'm gonna draw five names out of here. I added all the new names from July. So what do we got? I got one here. Is gonna be <laughs> Jonathan Wilhelm, Beverly Hills Ninja. Holy shnikes, right? I'm actually a fan of this movie, probably because I grew up with it, and I don't know any but I don't see the flaws that everybody else sees in it. Just enjoy myself. And what else do we got? Okay, uh, Yippie by Zentium, which is a vampire film. I don't remember who did that one, actually. Focus. Uh, I have autofocus or help focus or whatever. And then what else? Number three would be Tristan Collier. Werner Herzog film I have not seen. It's probably going to be Wojciech because that's the one with Klaus Kinski where he plays like a Nazi losing his mind. Sounds totally up my alley. I've seen a couple of his films like Nosferatu and Aquari Wrath of God, which are both great. So um, and I definitely got to go with one of the Kinski ones though that I haven't seen. So this is number four. Oh, Tom Brooker, Dark Ride, which I believe is one of the eight films to die for from the first series. I'm going to check that out. I got some cool ones so far. Nothing, nothing that's like, oh man, that, not that it would be a chore, but it would just be a little bit harder for me to get into in comparison. So it's one, two, three. What do we got? I usually do five. So it's four. One more. That's going to be, oh geez, Jim Simon Happiness, which is a great film by Todd Solans, Todd Solans, or how the hell is his name? And I haven't watched this in years. I just remember watching that movie for the first time with a group of friends. And I, I was a lot younger. And one of my friends started laughing. And I was just like, what is wrong with you? Not realizing that most of that movie is a comedy. And now as I'm older, I'm just like, it is a comedy. But I was so disturbed, I couldn't laugh. And I was actually perturbed by them laughing. Or I was just like, what the fuck? Um, but it is it's like, welcome to Palindro Welcome to Dollhouse. No, no, uh, Palindromes is the one I watched. And like, as dark as it is, I caught myself hysterically laughing at points. And I don't know, I'm looking, really looking forward to rewatching Happiness. So let's get into these questions, comments, and uh, eventually the question of the week. Ken Coakley, I admit that I'm a huge... So basically I ask you masterpiece movies, movie masterpieces under 90 minutes. <coughs> I ask on Facebook and YouTube. So Ken Coakley, I admit that I'm a huge Universal fan. So when it comes to under 90 minute movies, they have the best option... Uh, Best in my opinion. My favorite of the bunch is Bride of Frankenstein. Ilsa Lancaster not only plays the bride, but she also plays Mary Shelley in the beginning. She was incredibly beautiful. I also like Dr. Frankenstein's mentor, Dr. Pazoris. Lovecraft much? 
I think they use the same name in uh, From Beyond, of course, yeah. So I have uh, the British Arrow copy of Texas Adios. I love the cast. Jose Sorez, who played the guy that Franco Nero went after, uh, was in another spaghetti western called The Forgotten Pistol Arrow as the protagonist's father protagonist father nero's brother in texas adios was played by alberto de la Oqua, who is a facebook friend that i still keep in touch with sadly my copy of texas adios is still at home and i'm still at rehab still trying to walk again sorry about that yeah that he's uh the uh Aqua guy is like uh you know he's like one of those uh guys from that big uh stunt family um that are all in zombie isimicio dream home is awesome would be cool to see a 22 shots episode on modern day Hong Kong horror. Hmm. Wink. I enjoyed girly, but it was goofy masterpieces under nine minutes. Well, there goes every amazing Japanese film ever made. Ha ha. <laughs> Ain't that true. Japanese films are at least like three hours. <laughs> Even Evil Dead Trap is is like is like two hours, and you're just like, what is going? Why isn't this movie ended yet? Um, Chris Rivers, hey Dave, glad you enjoyed The Public Enemy. My answer for the question of the week is a tie between my two favorite Vincent Price films: House on a Haunted Hill, 75 minutes; House of Wax, 88 minutes. Just missing the cut were Halloween, 91 minutes, and Nightmare on Elm Street, 91 minutes. Keep up the great work, man. Thank you, Nick Mua. Masterpiece is under 90 minutes. A lost art indeed. I'm gonna go with the two Jimmy Sangster features: Nightmare 82 and Brides of Dracula, 85. At Hammer Studios, they really mastered the art of trimming any movie fad. It seems. Uh, was G Brides of Dracula, I think, was still a Terrence Fisher. I think he was just a writer on Brides of Dracula. Correct me. I'm not 100%, but I feel that might be a Terrence Fisher directed. Um, Nightmare, though, that's, is that the one with Oliver Reed? I, I miss that. I always confuse that and Paranoiac. I think they might both have Oliver Reed. I'm not 100%. So we have questions. Have you, guy, have you, have your eyes ever really deceived you? I don't mean Argento style, but, uh, I don't, I don't know what you mean by that. My eyes ever deceived me? Uh, like one time I thought that I, I could have swore that Debbie Massar and Fer uh, Fariska Bulk were the same. And I was just like, what? I was so confused. That's just a mistake. Who would you like to make a documentary about, Mr. Romero, your parents? Um, I'd probably be more qualified to make a documentary about my parents. I might be able to do that eventually. Will you and Jeremy sing your favorite Disney songs in an upcoming show? No. Um, P.S. My answer from last week vantage, so here it is again. Firstly, about your question to my question annoying ass hats in the Blu-rays you've always wanted. I loved your scroll down Argento Lane, sir, even though your cat doesn't. She is one of the cats from Argento's Inferno. Is she is she because they were killer? Uh, documentaries about movies are difficult to get right. Make them too uh, clinical and they come across as disconnected or uninspired. Add too much sentiment and you're stuck with gushy fan letter. My absolute favorite would be the uh, appendices. The making of Lord of the Rings. It's, it's a long one. There are six volumes. Runtime about 20 hours. But there is so much passion, passion oozing from it. I can only hope there are still filmmakers today who can muster half that passion. Also, excellent is on Earth and I'm told the path to a pet cemetery and Susan Blummert, Miss, Missy Dan story on that are darkly funny lastly i've got to mention forgotten scares an in-depth look at flemish horror cinema if there's anything you want to know about horror films made in my neck of the woods that's the doc for you part two coming out next year cool i, I didn't know about that one david scott great video as always question of the week evil dead evil dead 2 texas chainsaw massacre the original wreck the witch if you they cut two minutes out of it hey now that's not the rule uh travis wright texas chainsaw massacre also beverly hills ninja that's right um i am haru of the takador dojo um mr nanny a bride of chucky dead flintstone sorry to mention a 92 minute movie but point blank with lee marvin it is truly great I'd also include Duck Soup, Kubrick's The Killing, and Eraserhead. Mood 616. George Hilton drinking like a fish is worth the price of admission for massacre time. LOL. Very true. I am the Ice Lord. Awesome stuff, Mr. Parker. Thank you. Burns Burns from... What is that? Burns Burns from Candle. Can I ask you where you got that ultimate Cabal cut? Would you like very much to get it? I would like very much to get it. My favorite movie. Have the Cabal cut. Wish they extended it. Universe in a series. I wish they did as well. Bum House, uh, Bumpus Ho uh, Hounds, question of the week. Top five masterpieces under 90 minutes. A Razorhead, love it. Targets, Evil Dead 2. You were never really here. That's under 90 minutes. That's a great movie. If anybody hasn't seen that, watch that. It's great. Storytelling is his fifth. Fruit Wobbler, wow. Such an unexpected pick covering Lilo and Stitch. Amazing choice and great discussion. Please do something wicked sometimes. Sometime. I will eventually. Keith Boyd Jr., Deadbeat at Dawn. Last House on Dead End Street. Al Blyton, Toy Story, William Adcock, Predator, Jason Hammond, The Virgin Spring, Jonathan Edward Smith, Tex Chainsaw Massacre, 74, obviously, Nathan Rumler, Reanimator, Robert D., The Beyond, Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer, Angst, Michael Miller, Happiness with Philip Seymour Hoffman, somebody 
replies, Vincent uh, Pereira, Michael Miller, happiness is two hours and 14 minutes long. And then Michael Miller posts Doom Generation, Keith Foy Jr., 95 minutes, I think, right? So Michael Miller is not following the rules. Am I the only one who cares about the goddamn rules? Sorry. Or maybe fucking rules. My bad. Uh, I can't remember the exact quote from Big Lebowski. Uh, Brian Ziegler, reanimator. Justin Morales, how far back are we talking? A lot of movies in 30s and 40s, including many of the Universal Classic Horrors, were barely longer than an hour. Any movie. Uh, K- uh, K- Kirian Fisher, Rashomon. Derek B. Wreck. Yo- Joachim Johansson, the episodes of MacGyver I've seen this far. MacGyver movie. Uh, Daniel, Danny Torkle, Run Lola Run. I would have never guessed that was under 90 minutes, 80 minutes. Uh, Jason Hoover, Ice Cream Man, Shazim Barbarian, Slimy Little Bastards, 66 minutes. Uh, Tim Mellican, Trancers, Edward Payson, Rope, uh, Sean Donahue, Slimy Little Bastards, Stop It. Um, Jeff Thompson, The Incredible Shrinking Man, Scott Davis, all the all time great horror classics, Cal- Caligari, Nosferatu, Dracula, Frankenstein, The Hammer Films, The Corman Post Cycle, Cody H. Gearhart, Elephant. Lacey Lou, Stand By Me, Troy Howarth, Frankenstein, The Black Cat, 34, The Old Dark House, Bride of Frankenstein. Somebody's a big James Whale fan. Uh, Joe Ostricka, Evil Dead, Jamal Potter, The Last House on the Left, Freaks, 32, Evil Dead Trilogy, Borat, Pie, The Wicker Man, original film, original cut, Primer, Sexy Beast, Matthew Hudson, Buster Keaton's a general from 1926. The stunt work and action scenes in that sucker are amazing for the time period. It was what started my interest in silent film. Despite the fact it's a Civil War movie made in 1926, which primes it for being problematic by today's standards, of which certain parts are certainly are. Though not nearly as problematic as many of the silent era films of that era are. It's basically, at its core, a train chase movie. If you happen to want to watch a silent movie from 1926, this is a fun one, and despite its occasional use of problematic song, I really recommend the Carl Davis score from 1987. Literally spent years trying to find a copy of the score, and he posts a link. Cody's uh, Corey Zunk, an American Tale. I think it's 80 minutes. Matthew Hudson replies, uh, this, the mouth singing somewhere out there still makes me tear up. Any of those old cartoons where a mother and uh, a kid are immediately separated, I'm like, uh, I think that happens in American Tale. It's been years. Uh, Eric Leckberg, I would obviously say a Halloween, but it's 91 minutes, so don't say it. Hey, it's a win. I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. Jason Lindbergh, Freaks and Apple Cart. Uh, Zach Hill, Persona. Great choice. Uh, Scott Davis, Zach Hill. Good one. Total Masterpiece. James Higgins, Stand By Me. Jay Wall, Censor, 2021. I'm looking forward to watching that one. Thomas uh, Nathan Thomas Millender, Stand By Me. Frankenstein, Pickpocket, Rope, Before Sunset, The Killing, Evil Dead. This is Spinal Tap, City Lights, Breathless, Airplane, The Wicker Man, Rashomon, Francis uh, Ha, which maybe that's, I don't know what that is. Sexy Beast, Eraserhead, Rec 1 and 2. Nick Gadsby, My Neighbor Wants Me Dead. Silent, serial, realistic horror film. He posts a link. I wonder if it's a movie he did. Uh, Mike Merriman, St. Maud. And Mike Mer- uh, J- Justin Patrick says, Masterpiece, replies. Sam Kelly Mills, Beauty and the Beast, Red Eye, Persona. Carson Peters, all James, ba- James and May Bell films. Pretty intense stuff. Never seen anything quite like his movies. Greg Watson, Army of Darkness. Greg Watson also says Wizards. Brandon Helmuth, Helmuth, The Beyond and Black Sunday. Eric Whining, Persona, Punch Trunk Love, Modern Times, The Lion King. Vincent uh, Pernata, Welcome to the Dollhouse. Elliot Ross, Dumbo, Shane Glass, Bag Boy, Lover Boy, which is an absolute bonkers movie. So, for the question of the week, movies that were given a true second life on Blu-ray. I'll say Born for Hell. That is one, absolutely. So basically movies that were were basically thrown in the trash and then they hit Blu-ray and everybody's like, oh, this is great. And it, it's an amazing movie. I know Vinegar Syndrome does a lot of movies. And I know a lot of people complain about that. They'll be like, well, this turd nobody liked and it hit Blu-ray and everybody's acting like it's the greatest thing since sliced bread and it's still a fucking turd. That's not always true. Sometimes a movie nobody's watched for years hits Blu-ray and it actually is a great film and it gets a second life, a well-deserved second life. So, um... A movie that, what is the question exactly? Movies that were given a true second life on Blu-ray. There we go. And now we're going to hop into the update. Okay, starting this update out with Deadlock, which uh, Vinegar Syndrome, it's on their partner labels. It is uh, Subculture, which I'm glad they picked this up as their partner label. Um, This is a 4K. That's right. Limited collector's edition. Written and produced by Roland Click. This is a, I I mean, this may be one of the first... uh, overseas uh westerns released on 4k see this is a movie that i see just its name only i'm not 100 percent familiar with it but i'm gonna grab any western especially old style movie on 4k just to check it out very cool maybe i'll watch that this week if i get a chance then we have through the fire 
which is a movie that I not familiar with. And usually a lot of the horror, older horror films I've at least heard of. Like, you know what I mean? I'll know the title. That's Maybe that's it. Maybe I haven't watched it. But I don't feel like I know anything about this movie, to be honest. So, very exciting to check that out. 88. Find it in the back, it said, after finding an amulet. It's very 80s, right? And then, I guess we have another kind of movie that feels similar to that. The Lamp. Love that cover art. This is AKA The Outing. I know I already had like a double feature Blu-ray release, but yeah, this is a weird movie. It's been years. I remember the ending, ending pretty awesome in like a museum. So I've not watched this one in, a, in over a decade, maybe 20 years is more likely. I remember seeing it as a kid under the title, The Outing. And then we have Killer's Delight, which was a uh, Shriek Show DVD. Never seen this. I think maybe this is the one that's loosely based on Ted Bundy. Five girls this week. How many next? I don't know. Tell me. Uh, yeah, that's a crazy cover art. Oh, that's nuts with everybody breaking like glass. I never seen that cover for that movie. Wonder if it's a German or something and looks like a uh, fun city center replacement for walking the edge. Very cool. And then we have mail order murder. So the story of wave productions looks very cool. So this is a strange story. This is like, this company was like a, you like how you would write a song and send it off and they would make it. They did that with low budget movies. So I'm really interested to watch uh, this. So yeah, documentary. Documentaries about films are like forever watchable. Like no matter what you put it in, I'll, I'll immediately start watching. Uh, and then we have Sound and Fury, a film by John claude Bristow. I hope that's how you say it. This sounded interesting. Looks gorgeous. This is a... Um, what is this company again? Altered Innocence, which I, I really like what they're doing. They do good work. So, not seen this. I try to buy their titles for the most part from the partner labels. Then we have uh, Rancho Deluxe, which I've never seen with Jeff Bridges. Popular movie. Heard about it before. And also, who else is in the Sam Watterson? I feel like Slim Pickens is in here and Harry Dean Stanton, so that's a great cast. Can't go wrong with that. Fun City is a, a label that I bought all their stuff so far. Not even watched one of their releases, and I feel like a jerk. I, I, I really I really ought to catch up and just watch all of them. <laughs> just do a cover on all of them. Um, right now they have one, two, three, four, five, six already. I'm so far behind, man. Time flies. Um, so and then we have this 4K. I should have shown this in the other 4K. of True Romance. Uh, import. I... Love True Romance, if you guys didn't know. Tony Scott movie written by Quentin Tarantino. Probably one of the best cast ever, even though everybody's not in the movie forever. But we have Christian Slater, Patricia Arquette, uh, Dennis Hopper, Val Kilmer, Gary Ullman, Brad Pitt, Christopher Walken, Samuel Jackson, Tom Sizemore, Chris Penn, Bronson, uh, Bronson Pichow. Who else is in this one? Um, uh, geez, Michael Rabaport is in here. Just an amazing amazing cast one of the best um um paul ben victor kevin corrigan just going off the characters not listed on the back it's just an amazing freaking movie one of the all-time best uh, james gandolfini and then we have the public enemy um watch this uh, i think last week or something this was so good i had to have the blu-ray i rented it on amazon so james cagney movie it's just great movie had to have it did not feel right not having it and last is a dvd so i've been seeing mike malloy on some special features hearing him on some podcasts and i realized i didn't have his euro crime documentary so i picked this up he directed this uh, Euro crime documentary, has a bunch of interviews with the people in here. Um, some greats on here. Franco Nero, John Saxon, Henry Silva, Antonio Sabata, Fred Williamson, Luke Miranda, Joe Del Sandro, Chris Mitchell. Those are some heavy hitters. Um, so, yeah, very excited to finally watch this. I put it on. I love John Saxon. I, got, I was uh, lucky enough to get to meet John Saxon. Um, so, anyways, I guess we're going to hop back to the video. All right, guys, thank you very much for watching. And as always, have a good one. Thanks.